Welcome to the Dissident Mama podcast. Today, my guest is Foundering. Foundering is the moniker of pianist and singer-songwriter Kylan Digitaldi. With a specialty in ragtime and early jazz, Kylan started one of the first YouTube channels featuring ragtime and stride piano. But Foundering is also known for his satirical songs about conspiracies and other social commentary, some of which have been suppressed, with a few choice ditties being outright banned by the technocratic gatekeepers. Kylan has been a touring member of the international sensation Postmodern Jukebox, with whom he has performed in over 50 cities on four continents. When he's not triggering the feels of YouTube and band camp censors or performing live, the Santa Cruz native is also proud is also a proud dad to a 10-year-old daughter, as well as a renowned Scrabble player and one of the world's fastest anagrammers. Welcome, Kylan. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Thank you. Well, we have a lot to talk about. So let me tell folks how I discovered you. It was just a couple of months ago. Yeah, I'm actually curious myself. (laughs) I was writing a little Russia-Ukraine series through a Dixie and Lens is kind of the, the, the going headline. I've done two parts. I have a third if I can ever get to it, uh, ready to roll or close to it. But anyway, I was searching up, you know, um, no Russian ever called me a white supremacist. No Russian ever called me a Nazi, et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, okay, I want something to kind of um, illustrate what I'm trying to say here. And there you go. Your video came up, no Russian ever called me a cracker. And then my foundering journey began. (laughs) So I actually linked to, I think it was in part two of my series, to two of your videos. But since then, I have kind of been binging on your stuff and listening to the deep cuts because you've been doing stuff for a very long time, some going back more than 10 years. So I reached out for an interview and here you are two months after I discovered you and I want the whole world to know about you. Amazing. Well, that's so (laughs) sweet of you to say, you know, that's so funny that you found me via memes essentially, Mm -hmm. because that's what that concept was. The no Russian ever called me a yada, yada, yada. As an artist right now, I think it's a really exciting opportunity to the, the mimetic nature of how information is spreading is perfect. If you know how to tap into that as an artist, it is a gold mine. It is a creative gold mine out there. And it can be as simple as reading headlines to reading your comment sections on videos. Some of my best ideas I found have come straight from the comment sections in my videos because of that, that interplay, that back and forth that you, that a creator should have a healthy relationship with their audience. Right. And Mm -hmm. when we're dealing with this censorship issue, a lot of times we feel we're in our own little vacuums and, and, and it's harder to break out. And as an artist, you suffer as a result because you need that stimulation. You need, you need that back and forth, it, not just, not just some um, criticism or encourage, you need the ideas, you need the free flow of information. So we can talk about what censorship does in terms of politics and all that, but from an artist perspective, it, it inhibits creativity and inhibits the arts. And, and I found myself over the years becoming disillusioned with the, the whole artistic process, I hate to say. I mean, I, I, I found myself, I, I decided I wanted to be a musician about 20 years ago and when I was mid, mid-teenager. And that journey since, you know, you're supposed to have your up and downs, you're supposed to have your struggles. But when you're going up against the, the big tech juggernaut, the censorship machine, as an artist, it's, that's yet another hurdle that you have to overcome when you, just doing the thing is hard enough, just coming up with the idea of being comfortable with sharing something, being vulnerable in that way, that's hard enough as it is, but then to wonder like, am I getting the reach? Am I being shadow banned? Am I all, all these things? It's the last thing you wanna deal with in addition to all that. I mean, maybe some people like that, but for me, I kind of got tired of that, the, 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 whole, the whole process of that. And then when I realized that if you sort of fight fire with their fire and, take the things that they are saying you're not allowed to do and then sort of put it back at them in a satirical, comical, I don't know what you want to call it, in a way that is, you can fly under the radar to a certain extent. And what you were saying, how you found me with with No no Russian, I I remember I I actually got that in a YouTube comment. Someone said, hey, your next song, you should just, uh, you you should write one called No Russian Ever 
ever called me a cracker. And I, you know, that's a meme that's been on, on 4chan and other, other places. And I, and I, my first reaction was, that's just silly. That's like, that's <laughs> what I'm not going to, that's going to be a really dumb song. If I try to, I mean, <laughs> maybe I didn't have enough faith in myself. I, I didn't think I could do that concept, you know, do it justice. But then with all this inspiration I've got lately, which I, we can get into, I, I sat down and, and then I wrote the song and I'm like, you know what, this is going to work just fine. And, and the rest is history. But um, just to finish with that thought of, 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 of memes and how they are, they're powerful. We're in some sort of almost, I don't want to call it warfare, but a mimetic warfare type situation where it's these it's a battle of ideas and concepts mm -hmm. and as a as an artist musician social commentator it is the best time ever to be around and of course you should know them probably more than anybody else doing what you do so. <laughs> <laughs> well i love satire and i don't think it's done enough well um because it is the one thing that really does get under the skin of let's say elitists or whatever people who um wish to control me and you wherever we are on the spectrum of um, worldview or whatever. And so many times people won't attack me for what I say, they just say I'm mean. You know, it won't be the content. Is that kind of what you uh, experience that, oh, you're just mean, stop making fun of people where they're not actually going after what you're saying so powerfully? Do, do you know what I'm saying? Yes, yes yeah. Um, just a, a, probably an extreme example of that. W one of my, um, one of the videos that sort of set this whole thing off uh, for me recently, uh, back mm -hmm. in November, was I made a, uh, I wrote a song called "You Will Never Be a Woman," mm -hmm. and that one was just I, kind of a spur of the moment, like literally in the shower. I was in the shower, and I, oh, this would be <laughs> hilarious if I write a song, and it just came, you, know, you will never be a woman. And then the rest, I said, okay, I have to do this. And it was just a joke. It was the very tongue in cheek, nothing serious, not even mean. If you actually look at the lyrics, they're just, they're very, it's very tame compared to where I went later with some songs. It's, it's very innocuous, but I had some very strong reactions. I'm still getting I don't know if I would call them death threats, but messages to kill myself and all sorts of stuff just yesterday. I mean, all the time from that video, it's still, it's still happening. And one person in particular who actually um, reached out to my employer, found docs me or whatever. I mean, I give my oh. name online, but they, they mm -hmm. ser searched me out and, uh, and tried to get me fired for it. Um, they later admitted that they actually didn't watch the song or listen to the, listen to the song or watch the video. They had, they, the title was enough for it, the, the, just the, the notion, the mere concept that somebody had written a song about this one thing that mm -hmm. angered them so much, that was enough to, to determine who I was, my person, you know, everything about me. Wow. You know, it, enough to try to ruin my life, essentially. Um, so that, that, yes, I can see where you're going with that. And I, uh, I, I will say the satire thing, I, especially during the COVID era, became not just the most effective way to get information out or your message out, it became the only way to do so. Mm -hmm. um, I, I tend to, to harken back to the idea of, of, of a court jester and how that is very important. Though the role of the, the court jester is important now to both the elites and the so-called elites and the rest of us, they like to have an outlet for the anger and the frustrations. In other words, the court jester is the one person who can mock the king to his face and get away with it to a certain extent, right? You can't go too far, but they, that, that one person has that, that permission. And that is good for the uh, stability of that sort of power structure for those in power, because then they can have the, 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 the peons feel like they have their outlet a little bit. <laughs> and then, but, but also, it gives them more strength than you would, more power than you think. And especially the jester himself, mm -hmm. it's, it's a dangerous position, right? You have this fine line you have to walk. And I remember I was, uh, we, we, can, we can get into this more, but I, I, I was very much ex in a state in December of 2019 where I was prepared, not necessarily for COVID, but for something very much like COVID with a sp specifically a viral event that was going to be overblown. I wasn't going to be afraid of it, but I was ready for it. And when it happened, 
And I felt like I didn't do and say enough to stop it. I got a little depressed, I'm a lot depressed by it. I felt like I felt like more could be done. Is it not that I could have like prevented it or could I have just, I could have said and, and done more, you know? And I remember I, I, thinking, I'm never gonna write a song about this. I should write a song, but I, I shouldn't. And I, I um, uh, on YouTube, I was, uh, I stumbled on JP Sears, who I, I've known for a while. And I'm sure you're, you're familiar with, with JP. And, and I, I saw how he was doing, he was questioning the COVID narrative, but in a way that was, he was playing the role of the court jester. What I, it felt to me like he was being the court jester where he was clearly being sarcastic and saying absurdities, but in a way that he was getting away with it on YouTube. I, I thought yes. it clicked for me. And I said, hey, this is what I need to do. I need to write songs like this. And what's that one line from, from my song? I'm going to quote myself here. Um, there's certain things you cannot say, so sing them all instead. Right. So it, it, with, it, for JP, it would be satirize them instead, be, be, play the joker, to be the parody man instead. But for me, I thought, well, hey, I, what I do is I, you know, I'm most, most comfortable behind a piano singing and I have two decades worth of songwriting abilities. I can't just throw that away. So I sat down and I was going to never write a song, an original song on YouTube ever again. That's where I was at that point in my, in my situation. And I, and I wrote a pandemic dance. I wrote a 10 minute epic about just describing from my perspective, what was happening. Uh, this was in September uh, or August or September. I wrote this of 2020 pre-vaccine rollout. And I wrote this and I put it out there kind of thinking, a little, I was like ducking a little bit. I'm like, oh, I was expecting maybe a YouTube ban for it because of the climate at the time, but it 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 passed. It passed by, and and you know they shadow banned it from search results and all these things, but they didn't delete it. And then I thought, okay, okay, this is something that we can do. And I wrote the um, the, the the election fraud video of the year uh, song a year later after that happens, and um, here we are today. As I you know started speeding up a little more. So they had said the pandemic dance video was hate speech, but just shadow banned it. Oh, it never okay. was deleted. So to clarify, um, I had two videos. To, so I've been on YouTube since 2007. Yeah. I, I, I know. Right. Can you believe it? In fact, <laughs> I remember when I was when I was first got on it, I was I rolling my eyes at it. people had been trying to get me on it since it first came out. And I, I didn't want to. And then a friend kind of snuck a video of me and it was really bad. And back in 2006, I thought, oh shoot, I gotta put, I better, I need to put something up better than that. So in 2007, I started putting putting songs up, and I want to say that year I wrote a song called "The Shining Marquee," and uh, it was a uh, anti-war song. Um, I the the lyrics maybe not explicitly so though it does mention war in it. But I remember I wrote this kind of long diatribe in the con or in the this video description. Maybe this is this is 2007. I feel like this is pre. I'm not sure of the timeline. I think pre Google purchasing YouTube. Um, I wrote this long thing anti war, saying we need to get out. Um, uh, the the guy uh, Kylan, who I was named after, uh, a next door neighbor, ha was killed in Iraq in action, uh, which had a pretty profound effect on me. And and I so I started writing these songs in 2008. I wrote a song called Greed. And I called out the banksters at the time because that was during the crisis then. Now, keep in mind, my channel, maybe a thousand subscribers, maybe less, few hundred views per video. So it wasn't like I was substantial or anything. But after I started doing that, instead of just doing silly ragtime, ragtime songs, I noticed my channel was changing. Like the, I noticed views were being removed. I noticed subscribers going down. Um, I don't, I think maybe I was just algorithmically pushed into a certain category of, of, you know, up and coming whatevers. And, but over the years, I never got any warnings or channel strikes. There were a few videos where it said, oh, this con, I think my Werner von Braun update, I got a, um, oh, it's not advertiser friendly warning uh, on that one, but, uh, and, and my foil video where I covered weird Al Yankovic uh, fo foil song. And I just basically splurged 10 minutes of random conspiracies uh, into one, one video. And that was back in 2014. That one was heavily censored. Uh, I, I took apart the metrics of that compared to my SoundCloud and other, uh, other things. I pretty much showed that it should have hundreds of thousands of views. And to, 
to this day, it still says 15,000. And I think it actually is, it should even have about a million views. Uh, that's, a, that's a separate thing. So to get to what you asked about the pandemic dance, I had never had any strikes on my channel for content. There was one time last year when I was streaming silent films on Twitch, which was a great fun. I did it for a few months where I would put on a old Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin film and I had my piano and I would play live as people watched it in the chat. And it was just a blast. It was a lot of work, but it was super fun. Great challenge to play for two hours straight and make it up on the spot. It's, it's yeah. a, but for musically, it was, it was, it was crazy. I didn't, I got better little by little, but I, anyway, so I, I tried to upload that some of those videos onto YouTube and YouTube gave me a copyright strike for just uploading a silent film that was in the public domain. And I even had the Wikipedia page that said, this is in the public domain. And I use my own soundtrack. But the, the crazy thing is not that I uploaded it and then got the strike. It blocked me from uploading it and gave me the strike anyway. So it gave hmm. me a strike for even just trying to upload it. And it didn't say, hey, this is owned by somebody else. Uh, so that's when I knew that YouTube was not going to be playing nicely with me. And it was a huge blow to me at the time where I didn't have a, I was doing all this work for these silent films and writing my own soundtracks. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a way to share them because Twitch deletes them after a, a certain period of time. And mm -hmm. if I can't, I couldn't share them on YouTube. So now I'm actually, I'm uploading them on Odyssey, my Odyssey channel, okay. which I'm loving Odyssey. Uh, I, I don't, I haven't been doing any new ones, but I'm uploading slowly all the old ones I did on Twitch last year. So other than that one copyright strike on my channel, I, I, I wanted to put that, put that out there. I didn't have any problems until January of this year. Uh, I think on the 5th, they, or maybe the 6th, they updated their terms of service, YouTube did, and they were warning they were going to do it, and they were going to come after COVID misinformation, but yada, yada, yada. And I remember counting down the days to that and thinking, I'm in trouble, because I had just uploaded Oyve Shut It Down, which was, I had written as a troll, essentially, to YouTube to try to force them to take it down. So I was in this position of, uh, I just trolled YouTube. They're updating the terms of service. I really did expect my channel was going to get deleted uh, on January 5th. I thought it was a good chance at least. So I, I wrote a song called Alex Jones was right. And I dumped it as fast as I could onto YouTube, just in case it was my last song. And then on the fifth, I got, indeed, I got a note, a, a note from, from Google saying that I had two videos that were removed. Now, here's where I wanted to clarify. The pandemic dance was not removed for hate speech. It was removed for medical misinformation, which is hilarious because it's a song. I know I, <laughs> I, I hear that Bryson Gray, I think who, who was him, it was some guy that, some rapper that had mentioned COVID being a hoax or something in a song and he got his song removed. So this, it's not like it was totally unheard of, right. but my song in particular was clearly like, Satire. It was not like I start the song singing that JP Morgan and, and John Rockefeller conspired to sink the Titanic to start the Federal Reserve together. That's how I that's how I set the tone. Like, never mind that Rockefeller and the Morgans were were against each other at the time. And like uh, there's clearly there's things going on there. I, I'm it's it's called it's it's the art I'm setting the tone, right? I'm setting the mood of the piece that don't take everything I'm about to say seriously. It's 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 what I did with with foil. In back in 2014, and let me tell you, the internet of 2014 was different than, than it was now. I mean, we got Obama as president. Um, it, it was it was putting that video out there at that time was risky for me, and I had a lot of friends and um, uh, colleagues kind of look at me like, "What are you? What are you doing here?" So I, I when I made that video, I realized I, I could do a trick, and the trick was, you can get away with saying uncomfortable truths and controversial things if you surround them with clearly farcical or ludicrous notions, if that makes sense. Right. So here with, I am with aluminum foil, it was like a test. I was like testing YouTube, like testing the waters a bit. I'm singing about things like the NSA watching us, things like the assassination of, of Michael Hastings, the journalist, uh, things like this that are, that are like kind of serious uh, issues. But then I'm also the next very next line, I'm saying Keanu Reeves is the king of the vampires, <laughs> right? That he's in a more like, there is an actual conspiracy that Keanu Reeves 
not ne isn't necessarily a vampire, but he's an immortal being. And he's, there's pictures that people found back in the 1500s of a guy, it's like spitting image <laughs> of Keanu Reeves. So again, I'm just singing a song. I'm throwing every single conspiracy. I'm a data guy, right? I'm a pattern, rec I'm an anagram solver. I like to just look at all the combinations of things and some of the letters fit and make words and some of them make gobbledygook. The same thing is true for music on a page. If I look at, I'm, I'm reading music, uh, certain combinations work and others just don't. Same thing is true for, for conspiracies and, and life in general, really. Uh, there's just a lot of data. And if you go too far to the, the, the schizo, you know, the schizophrenic mode, you can get overwhelmed by it. But there's that fine line that you can walk of connecting those dots and mm -hmm. they can make fun of you with with you know crazy conspiracy charlie or whatever but there's a certain that that, that works it, it does and when when, I, when i'm writing these songs i try to give these uncomfortable truths and i package them I, I i present them in a way hopefully that i can fly under the radar now with pandemic dance they said this is medical misinformation i'm singing about the vaccine before it's released here. And I'm saying it's going to be this revolving door of disease. They're going to want to keep giving us to blah, blah, blah. And it's not going to really work. And this isn't, this is, but what's interesting is this was also during a time, lest we forget, I know this is ancient history in the long ago of 2020, <laughs> but this was during a time when Trump was president and ha every blue check basically was saying, I'm not getting the Trump vaccine. Uh, you know, th this is po it's not going to be tested. This is poison. Of course, how quickly they changed their mind after three weeks, three months. It would have shocked me if everything else in the last two years hadn't happened to keep shocking me. Everything is okay. every time, like even with this latest Ukraine thing, I'm like, I, I guess I'm not, I can't, it's hard for me to be shocked anymore. Yes. <laughs> right, of how, how quickly these out, about faces, this, this, we support the current thing goes in this, in this time, this acceleration of a time we have right now. So I write this pandemic dance, calling out the vaccine. But again, when a time when everyone was saying that, right, pre-vaccine, and they're trying to tell me that a song from 2020, August, September, was medical misinformation in January, 2022. Right. This is just ridiculous. So they sent me that and then they removed, oy they shut it down for hate speech. So that one they said was hate speech. Now they didn't clarify on that. I didn't say what about it was hate speech. So I, and to be, to be fair, I wrote that song to, to th partly to thank 4chan <laughs> because 4chan had revitalized my YouTube channel by finding You Will Never Be a Woman. When I wrote You Will Never Be a Woman, I thought it was going to be like every single other my other video I'd, or song I'd made in the last 10 years, which is forgotten in a week with just a couple hundred views. That's just what it is. So I wasn't expecting it to go anywhere. And indeed, it was that way for about a month. I uploaded in early November and then nothing. It was completely forgotten about, except for me trying to get fired, which is a story in itself. And then a month later, all of a sudden, I just started getting hundreds of comments. And I hadn't gotten that level of, of comments for since, I don't know, 2014 or something like that. It was crazy. And I'm like, I'm like, where is this coming from? And then all of a sudden I saw all these telltale little, little snippets. I'm like, oh yeah, these are definitely, this is definitely from 4chan. These, this is from 4chan. So sure enough, they, um, they found my You Will Never Be Woman video. Of course, they loved it. And then they were plastering it all over the place. And I'm like, oh my God, there's people that like this. I can do this and get it. I can do this and not have like death threats all filling the comments. I can actually have 98% like. The fact that I, it was shocking to me. It was shocking. You know, and, and to be clear, I had some friends that saw it and were very disappointed in me. And I, I don't, again, it is what it is. I'm not, I take these risks as I put myself out there and writing these songs. Um, but I had, even my employer, they were, they were shocked which was crazy because I have songs from 2014 where I'm like, the Holocaust didn't happen, la, 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 la. <laughs> and, but I'm, I'm obviously joking, right? I'm singing a song, right? And, 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 and yet here I'm one, you could never be a woman. And then that was the thing that got the threats. And then, uh, so clearly I had struck a chord here. So I, I was like, okay, I got to thank these 4chan guys. Like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write something for them. So I wrote, 
Oyve shut it down because it's right up their alley. Just right. all that stuff that they, they like to talk about. <laughs> and I just give the people what they want, you know. But also I was doing it to troll YouTube because I, I, <clears throat> I, I could. And I was trying to see how far I could go. So I got that message from YouTube, hate speech for Oyve and pandemic dance medical misinformation. I appealed them both immediately. And perhaps maybe my pandemic dance appeal was a little more convincing, partly probably because I, I didn't, I didn't really want Oyve to be restored. It was, it was getting a little out of control. Like it had, it had 50,000 views, maybe 40 or 50,000 views when they removed it, but it was gaining at thousands a day. And my channel was gaining hundreds of subscribers because of it. It was in, it was, it had implanted itself in the algorithm in a way that YouTube could not abide, if that makes sense. Like other videos, they, they, they're happy just to let disappear <clears throat> and they don't have to worry about the strike sand effect or anything. Not that my channel is big enough to, to, to warrant that, but I feel like it was reaching a point where the YouTube, oh, they're like, oh, we, we got to, we actually do have to shut this down, which made it a self-fulfilling prophecy, right. which is the success in my, in my book. I mean, that was kind of the point of what I was trying to do. So they denied the appeal for Oyve and they accepted my appeal for pandemic dance, which felt like a big deal to me at the time, even though it wasn't really maybe in the grand scheme of things, but to me, it felt like a shift. I don't know why it was removed. I mean, maybe it had whoever had removed Oyve was like, oh, this one over here also has a bunch of reports. I guess I'll just remove this too. Maybe they didn't give it too much thought, but clearly someone had to review it at YouTube to restore it, right? And, and it, it calls out everything. It, it goes through the history of polio. It goes through the history of, of uh, AIDS, of Fauci, of Bill Gates. Um, you know, everything that we've heard now being talked as pretty much whatever in the last couple of years is now being ex accepted as not no longer conspiracy, Wuhan, all this stuff, even going to questioning viral theory and, 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 and terrain theory instead of that. So uh, I run through the whole, the whole thing and YouTube allowing it back up was a personal win for me because as I mentioned, it was a depressing time for me and I'm sure for a lot of people through the COVID lockdowns, but not because of the virus, but because of the, what, the fear that everyone had and that I felt like I was powerless to even the, everyone around me. And the, 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 very, the only thing I could do I, I moved my sights inward. That's what COVID did for a lot of, for everybody. Is it, it made us more community oriented. And I stopped trying to save the world, essentially. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, and, and, and focus more on my, on my community, on, on, on the families around here. I was the only parent that was outside playing with the kids without a mask on, with, with my daughter and her friends, you know, in the neighborhood. And, and being just, not that I was like, trying to flaunt, like, I'm not afraid. I was just trying to give that sense of normalcy that was clearly going to have enough that I was like, this is going to destroy these kids for, mm -hmm. for, for life. If this keeps up even a couple weeks and then it lasted years. So, uh, so I, I felt that that song was important for me to, to get it out there to say, to say, I said what I said and I did what I could at the time. And I gave the warnings that I could at the time in, in as serious a way that I could get away with without getting banned for it. So long answer to what you, you were saying uh, about how, you know, which, what I got removed. Um, I will credit YouTube for that. And I will also, also credit YouTube for the audience that I received as much as I like to hate on them. I was able to find my ragtime music community, ragtime piano community. I was able to get hooked up with Postmodern Jukebox. All wouldn't have happened in my career without YouTube. I'm a college dropout. I tried to become the rock star, you know, and, and to do that in the social media age is very, very difficult. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate even in the limited capacity that I have, I have received, you know, achieved. Yeah. That's how I see social media in general is it's a tool, you know, people, um, get so upset about it. Oh, you know, of course they're complaining on social media about people being on social media too much, but it's just a tool and how you use it. And if it opens up avenues to like-minded people, I'm sorry, you can probably hear my dog making noises. Sorry. <laughs> but anyway, um, back to you using YouTube as a tool, you know, you've alluded to this and given us some information, uh, but the way you, 
you troll them is uh, very interesting. I was listening to a video of you kind of explaining this and how you were banned from band camp too, but uh, well, not too, but like you were totally taken off band camp, which I want to ask you about. But as far as YouTube goes, you, you see it as you're not, them not letting you get too popular gives you an area or gives you an opportunity to be creative and innovative that you wouldn't have if you were uh, super monetized there. Can you tell exactly. us about that? Yeah, I, I do think the, the monetizer is a big one. Um, mm -hmm. I got off of AdSense mm, probably around when I made Foil. So around 2015 or 16, I, I, it's not like I was making money. I mean, I, I probably made $500 total over all my times from my YouTube channel. Uh, certainly not more than a grand. It's it's been a long time, but I, w once I realized just how um, completely corrupt everything was, I just didn't want to have anything to do with that that money. So I feel like not being monetized is a good thing for my channel. I don't know if that's right or not. That's just my intuition. That's my gut. Um, I, you know, they're making money from me, um, even if it's just a small amount. It's a business, right? It's a business model. I mean, I know that YouTube isn't necessarily doesn't necessarily uh, net Google a profit, but it is kind of like what Twitter is, and that Twitter is not necessarily worth forty four billion dollars. It's worth more because of it, the information, uh, the narrative control, right? The right. the whole system of the shadow manning, and that's why here here we are talking right now at a very at a, at a pivotal time, a changing, a, a time of change, a great change, where I think we're going to see things sort of shift in another direction. I'm, I am, I am a, I'm an optimist at heart, and I always have been, and I will continue to do to be. And I, I think there's something to be said about being part of the system, but finding our own way. I, I, I at a certain point, I could have just left it YouTube completely and just gone put everything into Rumble or Odyssey or BitChute, but I think that period, this, the last six months, really, as we have been allowed more freedoms, as like, I don't, I don't think that YouTube video of Pandemic Dance would have been restored a year ago. This is, we're in a new time now. And I know, I mean, look what's happened in just a few days. I don't want to paint um, Musk as a false prophet here, but I do think that he, the, the changes that have I felt in the air over the last just a few days since since Twitter's is, is uh, changed a lot, it's gonna start spreading into these other, th these monopolies, they've, they've, they've all followed the same protocol when it comes to information management and narrative control. And all it takes is for one of them to falter a little bit. I mean, we have our gaps, we have our other things that are on the outside, but the, the change can't happen from the outside it has to happen from within as well both it needs to be we need to flank them from the outside but also be on the inside <laughs> and and i felt like i had this really unique position of being a little bit old, more long in my career i'm i'm mid 30s now getting older and and i don't necessarily have the same starry eyed also the same um vulnerability that you might have as a young artist where you have to be very careful what you say and you can mm -hmm. do. And I have sowed my wild oats a bit. I've toured around the world with incredible uh, bands, amazing musicians. I've, I've, I've seen so many amazing cities and places and I've done that. And now that I felt like that, that was sort of taken away from me with the COVID and, and just the, how that all went, fell through in my life, I realized that, that I needed to do a pivot and Mm -hmm. We needed more more people that are in this kind of unique position of already having a little bit of a uh, of a whatever an audience, but not necessarily too much to lose. I when I made I already had hardly anything to lose when I wrote "You Will Never Be a Woman," but it all it also but it almost screwed me over. Like right. I thought that I, that was, I mean, that was tame. And yet here I was, I had a meeting with, I was an organist at a church. It was one of my main gigs, like a serious, I was a church organist um, for 10 years. And here I am, you know, I, I had just had a serious conversation. We had been closed for a year and a half, which I found to be just a crime against humanity. Uh, and I was in there just a week earlier for the first time. Of course, they're all like, they're all covered up and everything. They're all the, 
And, and we had this heart to heart with me and the, and the rector about just how we need to make sure that everybody, that, that we're not gonna force the vaccine on people, that we're not gonna be, it's gonna be mass optional. We wanna make sure everyone's welcome in church, all, all that, yada, yada, yada. Of course, they're just nodding and smiling and just like com completely ignoring everything that I'm saying. I didn't know this at the time. And then they call mm -hmm. me in the next day and I'm like, okay, we're gonna figure this out. We're gonna figure out how this vaccine thing is gonna, this is gonna be great. And then they started talking to me about like how I'm a tranny hater or something. And I, I couldn't, I, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I just, I'm like, I'm ready to quit over this mask and vaccine mandate, or I'm getting forced out essentially. And here they are talking about, about women and my YouTube, they wanted me to make an apology YouTube video uh, and explain that it was just a joke. And I'm like, okay, so this is just making my decision to part ways with this, this church a little bit easier. So I, I don't know. I, I, I think that it's just like when I, when I wrote the pandemic dance, I felt obligated that I had to say something and, or do something. I have 20, 30 years of now piano skills and I've been writing songs and I can put, I'm, I know words, I can write lyrics. There's no reason why I shouldn't be doing what JP is doing, but in, and all these other guys that I'm seeing. And, and I, I've, I've been inspired for so long. And I spent, I spent 10, 15 years instead of really furthering my career, learning about the world. I mean, I dropped out of school uh, in the mid 2000, 2005, early 2005. And I got myself a, a um, Pro Tools, which is a, a music recording software. And I made a bunch of albums. And then all of a sudden I was 19, 20, and I didn't have school. I didn't have a job. I didn't know what to do with myself. So I just started learning. I started reading books. I um, I, 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 I found William Cooper and I listened to his hour of the time and I bought all these like dozens of books that he recommended. And I was reading about all this crazy stuff. I got read uh, Behold a Pale Horse. And I'm like, oh my God. And I started, and I started listening to Alex Jones. At first I'm like, this guy's totally crazy. He's just shouting off about vaccines. Like this is pretty entertaining. I like it, but it's, it's a little bit too much for me. And, and like I, I mentioned, I, I, I had um, the guy who I was named after was killed in Iraq. And, and I, I didn't buy, I was the perfect age I don't know if this makes sense. I felt like the right age for 9-11 and in the, the following period of being 14, 15, 16 and old enough to think for myself, but maybe not too old where I wasn't fully indoctrinated in whatever uh, the, the narrative. And I, I, I didn't believe it. I didn't know what it was, I, but I didn't, I felt like I was, we, we were lied to, but I wasn't necessarily, I wasn't a conspiracy theorist by any means. So I, I felt like I, I spent so much time researching and learning and 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 I could have done I could have just been working on my career I mean I was ra raising a kid so let's be fair I did I did have a kid um, her mom decided that she wanted to to work um, and I was at this time when I was doing less gigs I had my church gig I was working with uh, choirs and schools and musicals and local schools very flexible hours so it's not like I had a nine to five so it worked out so I stayed at home when my daughter was born 10 years ago um, for the first several years, just doing that, just being with her and playing, studying my ragtime and then learning about how, how things are actually working. And, and then I, I, I started, and then I joined my band. I started to tour and, and I was gone for about half the year when my daughter was four ish. And that was too hard. It was too rough. I had been raising her for three years. You know, her mom was too, obviously, but it was, you know, I had a really strong connection. Right. And it ended up working, you know, her mom is a touring musician too. So she's gone now for six weeks on, on, on tour right now. So I'm, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on duty. Uh, it's, we're still, we're still going here. Um, but um, I apparently you have to do it for 18 years. I don't know. <laughs> I guess that's a thing. Uh, so I felt like finally I could apply this knowledge that I had. And I finally had the chops to do it where songwriting is not like piano came naturally singing and songwriting didn't come as naturally. It's a thing that it's just, it has to develop. Everyone has their strengths, right? And for me, I was playing Scott Joplin and an entertainer, ragtime, Maple Leaf Rag, and that's what I love to do. And I, I, I got to meet, um, I'm not sure if you know Tom Breyer. He's like the great sight reading ragtime piano legend. He's, he's got multiple um, viral YouTube videos. So I, I was able to meet him uh, early on and he became sort of my mentor and and so I, I was you know, happy studying this and, but not happy in, you know, in that 
I could have been working more on just getting gigs and working on my career. And I found that I was more interested in just learning about everything. And, and now that everything stopped and gigs stopped, I, and I, I lost my church gig and I lost, no one's doing show. Every venue in town revi- is, uh, requires the vaccine and all this stuff. And I, I'm like, okay, I guess I will stream and write spicy songs. So, and the rest is history. Right. <laughs> right. Yes. You're, you say spicy songs and uh, somewhere on one of your uh, uh, websites, one of the platforms you use, you say the spice must flow. And I think that's uh, such a great, great way to just quickly encapsulate what you do. And I think it was a commenter on YouTube that was saying that, um, you know, you throw edgy shit at the algorithm, you know, <laughs> and um, then you in a video had said, um, that's kind of like artistic supply and demand, the way you are pivoting, the way you are kind of going under the radar, still not being a nobody. I mean, you do have thousands of views, even though they are, you know, maybe limited, you know, your view counts or your subscription numbers, doctor with whatever, but it's, you're still not like super small potatoes, but uh, I just, I love that artistic supply and demand because you are giving the people what they want. And um, I, I like the fact too, that you're on so many different um, platforms, Subscribestar, Gumroad, YouTube, of course, Odyssey, Twitch, Gab, BitChute, Rumble, PayPal, if people just want to give you money. Um, what else are you on? Did I name them all? Uh, Telegram. Oh, and Telegram. Telegram. Yeah, I, 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 okay. I, I would even mention that I have maybe 250 or so followers on Telegram Mm -hmm. compared to 12,000 subscribers on YouTube. Right. And I am consistently getting more views on my Telegram videos when I post. Interesting. The last three or four videos I posted have blown YouTube out of the water, some even twice as much. Um, Now, there are a few that aren't and, and this is with me pushing it on my, my YouTube videos on Gab and all these other, mm-hmm. so they're getting views. Like yeah. um, I had um, my, we did it Reddit song got onto the, the top of, of Patriots.win um, pinned as the number one. Um, and that should have been many, 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 many thousands of views, but it only showed up as just a few thousand on YouTube. Um, so yeah. So it's, it's amazing how these other, these other platforms are now feeling that, and I don't, it's, you don't need YouTube anymore, but right. it's still an important tool to it have is. if you're doing what you're doing the right way. And I wanted to take what you were saying a step further about artistic supply and demand um, and that it is, it extends to the algorithm now. So the algorithm itself is in touch with the spice in that <laughs> it is now welcoming it. It is now, it is this change, this meme warfare that we're, we're mm-hmm. in right now. Whereas if I was trying to do what I was doing now a year ago, I just don't think the algorithm was there, was there or the, the people were, I, I don't know how to, to put it into words exactly, but kind of like what we're seeing on Twitter where mm-hmm. now the spicier stuff is going to, it's gone so hard in one direction that there's a vacuum there, whether yes. they like it or not. And the, the, for the most part, the big tech folk are gonna roll with it. As long as whatever you're doing doesn't rock the boat too much, they're gonna let you get away with it. Um, and I think I think that my Oyve shut it down was only removed, and this is just a, um, um, a theory, well, partly because it was getting so popular, but partly just because of the screenshot had the words Oyve shut it down. And if you type in Oyve shut it down, it's the first thing you're gonna get is, white supremacist thing, white supremacist, white supremacist, white supremacist, anti-Semitic, white supremacist. And, and so I think having that screenshot and with those words, I think YouTube was not a fan of that. Um, I, I have re-uploaded that same song. I've called it something else. I've just anagramized the, <laughs> the word, the letters in it, and YouTube doesn't seem to care. I haven't even gotten a warning on them. I don't think YouTube will care. I, I, I think that's there was a period of time I'm like, oh my God, if I upload this again, there I might get my channel removed. You know, right. I, I do I wasn't sure. But again, I am this lucky position of, I don't know if it's lucky, but I'm in this, I'm in this position of having maybe not necessarily much to lose. Uh if they delete my YouTube channel, I mean, I'm not making my it would be sad. Exactly. I would be sad, but I have my subscribe star now. I have and all this stuff was really only possible the last six months I've been pushing. I had I I've been on Gab, I've been on BitChute for a while, but then I'm like, 
that Odyssey, I'm feeling really good about. I have mm-hmm. almost maybe eight, seven or 800 um, followers on, 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 on Odyssey, which is no small feat, I think, for, for an alternative. Rumble is not working for me. I kind of get the sense that Rumble is kind of like the boomer alternative. Uh, I think for, so. But I don't, I mean, I like what they're great, what they're doing just fine. I mean, but I'm not getting nearly the, 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 the play. Um, I, I just went on BitChute out of curiosity. I noticed that my my uh, masked Christmas Jimmy Fallon myocarditis cover, which I was particularly proud of, um, that one is getting a ton of views on, on BitChute along with Oyve. And out of curiosity, I typed in piano to BitChute and Oyve is one of the first videos and piano music myocarditis shows up is one of the first two or three videos. So piano, I'm mean, BitChute. I'm like, okay, all right, BitChute. Yeah. So here we go. I'm um, representing the piano, I guess, with Oyve shut it down. Oh, well. Right. So, so uh, what were you going to say? I was just saying, I, I think of it as like a diversified portfolio, like, you know, doing your finances, you just have, you know, your toe a little bit in all these places. So you don't have to be so dependent and so scared. And, and, and I, I will mention that with um, in the context of, of, ba- uh, of Bandcamp and the, in yes. terms of diversifying my portfolio, I, so uh, about six months ago when my um, You Will Never Be a Woman video blew up and then I made Oy Vey and then my channel started going crazy. I'm like, oh my God, I have to like do this now. Uh, um, I, uh, I signed up for Bandcamp. Everyone's like, oh, I want to buy it. I want to buy it. I'm like, I, I don't have a website. I'll just get a Bandcamp. And I had a ragtime buddy, a friend who plays, plays ragtime piano. He said, you know what, Kylan, um, I've heard some things about Bandcamp that I don't trust. You should get Gumroad in addition to Bandcamp. And I had never heard of Gumroad before mm-hmm. um, since I, it's starting to pop up more. Uh, but I I said, oh, I kind of was like, ah, the last thing I need is another, another. one. I, I, <laughs> I, just, I can't only do like I was posting on Minds for a while and now people are saying, you got to do locals. I'm like, I can't, I can't, I can only, yes. I'm stretched so thin here. And I, you know, I try to, I try to um, stream on Twitch twice a week and I'm on Odyssey once a week. So uh, I, I signed up reluctantly for, for, for Gumroad. And then just a couple of weeks after um, YouTube removed Oyve, then Bandcamp deleted my account. And I, I made a video sort of describing that, but it was, it was unfortunate because it was at a time when I had just lost my job, one of my main jobs. I wasn't getting any gigs uh, locally. And Twitch, I don't really make, I don't have enough. I feel like I'm, I'm algorithmically suppressed. I think, I think all these sites, they all talk with each other. And it's not necessarily, a, they're all not in a meeting with their hoods. Or it's just a simple matter of <laughs> sharing their algorithms. And this person, found this word foundering is like, uh-oh, we're going to do it. So I have this strong sense that that Twitch is messing with me. And, and what's so interesting is th- th- these other sites have given us the perspective that we so badly need. For those of us who have been gaslit for a long time, uh, about what our true reach is. Um, because like what I was saying about Telegram, I, if I didn't have these other things, I would have no idea that I was getting this attention. Other you know, I, I, people were writing me messages and they said, hey, I saw your video on Telegram and it had 50,000 views and it's showing 2,000 on YouTube. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm like, oh, okay, that's amazing. I, I, apparently people are actually seeing this. So we now have this perspective and what that's what what we're witnessing in mass right now on Twitter with all, even if it's some of it's, you know, Twitter fuckery or whatever, but it, it, we're seeing all these conservatives just their, their accounts are exploding. They're getting all this reach. They're, they're doing all these tweets. They're getting all this, these impressions. They're getting all these followers. And, you know, some people are like, oh, well, maybe it's just, you know, Twitter, uh, twi- um, Twitter's messing with it. They're trying to, they're adding all this, you know, they, they've just admitted that it's all, all their numbers are fake for the last few years. The whole thing is falling apart and it's, it's great. And I can't see how this doesn't eventually spread what's happening at Twitter. Again, I'm trying to be, as I know there's some people that are more cynical, how they look at all of this stuff, but I'm trying to be as rose tinted as optimistic as possible here. And I do see this, this Twitter thing being a catalyst for something bigger and like what I'm saying with, with telegram, I'm, I'm checking, I'm comparing, I'm comparing, I'm looking at my phone. I'm like, wow, this has 2000 views. I uploaded this later than YouTube and YouTube is showing like 500. Something is, something isn't right here, you know? Right. And I think that this is probably one of the most exciting times to be someone like in my position or for all of someone like you, uh, before we all really just 
the algorithm is going to be us next. <laughs> if only, I hope you are right. I'm somewhere in the middle, not too rose colored, but certainly not very black For sure. So I have felt, you know, I'm happy about the whole Elon Musk uh, buying Twitter thing. But, you know, that I'm like, well, he kind of has a love child with Grimes. He's kind of into transhumanism. However, Neuralink, it, right? yeah, I really don't think it's about him so much because the day that he bought it and everybody realized, wow, we can say all these things now about COVID and trans stuff or whatever, you know, it's more about lighting a fire under people to think that speech to a degree, however you whatever degree you want to go to is a little bit safer than it was. And so, you know, it's like, it doesn't matter who's in charge. It matters what the masses, what the peons do, right? You, you know, you are right. I am choosing to remain. And I, I know I'm very much aware of all of the, the transhumanism and Grimes and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I remain, continue to remain um, optimistic about, about Musk in that he is, employing the type of mimetic warfare that I am familiar with and that the people that I feel like are on my side, if we're going to mm -hmm. make size out of this, we use in that he is using the same sort of playing off of his audience to create his ideas that I do on obviously a larger scale when I write my songs and that I'm, I'm literally seeing lines of someone was like, Hey, you should write a song called Mass Formation about mass formation. And I, I at first I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. But then I thought about it more. I'm like, yeah, that's that's great. I'm gonna do that. And it became one of my favorite songs. And it was literally one person that commented and it changed my life, you know, just because I would never have written that song, that one person. And I think that Elon does, he he wants to be liked by the people who the powers that be don't like, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Uh, the, the, the incorrigibles, the, the, um, what is the word that, that the, Hillary said, the deplorables. whatever the deplorables, that's right. That's, that's us. Uh, but yeah. in, <laughs> it's, it's the 4chan group. It's, it's, it's the, the castaways, it's the incels, it's the neats, yeah. it's all of us. It's, uh, we are the rejects of society, the meek right. We are the meek and we are inheriting this and some, like, I think that the, the, the meme, they don't have it. They do not have what, what we can do. And I, I think that Elon, as long as he's employing this type of meme warfare against that, and, and it, to create the sort of NPC re reaction that, <laughs> that we all know and love, uh, then I think that he is on our side. And I, 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 I think that he wants to be on that side and he wants that to be his legacy from my just gut feeling. I don't base mm -hmm. that on, on much uh, other than just sort of obs my observations. Um, I, I do think that there is a, a, a truth to the, 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 the idea that the left can't meme and mm -hmm. that why someone like me, maybe me more threatening. I don't know about that's the right word, but, um, uh, to that in that I don't, I'm not, I'm kind of a, the soy boy, like uh, I'm, I grew up on musicals. I sang in a choir. Like I'm not excited, you know, your manly man, right? I'm not like, that's not who my, what my persona is. I'm a, I'm an artist type, right? But I also, I'm, I'm not gonna, I didn't fall that direction. I went a completely opposite way as, as the rest of them. And it gives me a little more power in that I am, they will, and I'm trying to bring, I'm trying to make, both, I don't want to make it a right versus left thing, but I'm trying to make everybody meet in the middle by, I do try to make fun of everybody. I try to make mm -hmm. fun of the left and the right. I try right now, the left deserves it more. So they're going to get it more. If the things, the tables had turned, I'd be made. I mean, during the Bush, I was on YouTube writing anti-war songs during George Bush. Right. Era. George w. Bush. Like, I've been all, out of this for a long time, right? Um, a different capacity then, but I, I don't know. I think this is a this is a change and these older sites that have been the reddits out there the the twitters out there they they have their own brand of brainwashing and it is it is falling flat their memes don't hold the same weight anymore it's it's us it's the, it's becoming edgy now to question covid and even like maybe the election i don't know i mean we're getting we're going to get there the 2020 election is what i'm referring to i i, I think we're seeing that shift happening. Whereas on, on, on Reddit, you know, they, they're, 
they're afraid of, of, I know a lot of, I spent a lot of time on Reddit um, over the years. I had my foundering account since 2006 or seven on Reddit. I, I used to, to really appreciate what they did, what they did there. I remember I had a song, there was a, uh, maybe 2010 ish, um, some, some random Redditor had found, I'm going off on a tangent here, but this will, this will get to where we're going. <laughs> I, I had, they found an old, old piece, um, but that their grandparents had written, um, a, a piano piece and they didn't know that they had passed away obviously since, and they wanted to hear what it sounded like. So they shared it on Reddit and said, Hey, anybody want to play this? And I just happened to see it. And I recorded a video and I got maybe, I don't know, 50,000 views in a day. And I got on the front page of Reddit back when you could still do that being a genuine person instead of a bot. Right. And I just remember just the whole comment section was just full of love and, and, and support. Like you did this wonderful thing. And wow, this per- woman was so talented. It was their grandmother that had written the piece. It was a beautiful piece. And, and just the whole thing gave me so much hope for the future. And then it was crazy to see how in five years that Reddit and other places like it, I'm focusing on Reddit because that's where I spent a lot of my time, had turned into such a toxic um, environment where, um, for example, I, I, I started to really notice um, vaccine uh, questioning. If you question vaccines or talk about anything, you were you would get threats, like you would be attacked by the, the, the hive mind. And I I've noticed as I do my researching, as I'm trying to find all my little connect my schizo connections, that what causes the, not always, but what causes the ringing the most is generally the area, the sensitive area that you should probably keep on poking. That's not necessarily to say that what you have said that caused the, 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 the reaction was correct, but it was probably along the right, that Close. you found yeah. something, you found the right thing there and you need to keep going at it. And I use my sort of pattern recognition skills especially on Reddit, um, to see where the bots and where the energy was shifting to. And around two, yeah, the, the mid 2010s, I, I realized that vaccines was the big thing and that there was such an inorganic push against anybody questioning vaccines that I was like, this is, this is gonna be the next big thing. I don't know what it was or when it was gonna be, but I started to really put my in, um, interest in researching vaccines, the history of vaccines. And I do consider myself a, almost a, somewhat of an authority on the subject. Um, and that's, you know, I, I can write songs, write songs on it and stuff. So um, th- this, this, this pro- we're here for a reason in that social media created this, the situation of all this, the lies and everything and you know, the f- stolen elections, fake wars, you know, all this stuff. And now I feel, again, trying to be the optimist here, that we have this opportunity for this new brand of social media Mm -hmm. and this new generation. And this is, I'm saying generation, I'm talking boomers to to Gen Z here. This new type of thinking where it's controversy and being wrong about things, all this stuff is is okay. It's okay to say something and then be proven wrong as someone, like I, I, I think I read about you that um, you, um, I was once an atheist when I was a kid and I was like, oh, this is clear. I'm clearly an atheist. This is, this is ridiculous. And over the years, just with all the information that I've seen and every, all of my experiences, I've been able to recreate my worldview. And maybe as an artist, I can do that better than some others because I have a, some people have such a hard time thinking, admitting that they were wrong about something that maybe Trump and Russia didn't collude that maybe we shouldn't be doing all these vaccines by the time the kids are like two years old. Like all these things where they would get you banned before, if we're allowed to just discuss this, we can actually go over the nuances of, this is what they're afraid of. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get rid of the conversation by banning everybody because they don't want people to meet in the middle. People like me who are singing songs and I'm, I feel like I'm trying, I don't know, maybe I'm giving myself too much credit. I'm trying to bring the, the far left to, to, towards me as much as I'm trying to bring the far right towards me, if that makes sense. Because mm-hmm. doing once you put yourself on the outskirts, you are going to attract the outskirts, which is fine. That's what I, I mean, I love. I want there to be freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of ideas. But I feel like 
there's there's certain things that 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 each side find un, very unpalatable about each other, and that there is a way that we can just make fun of certain things, and then find that there are certain things that can be agreed upon that are just like the right to life and liberty and the pursuit of has certain things that are just so fundamental that once you distill them down to their very essence, it there, nobody disagrees. 99.99% of people. And I think that's what Elon was saying. Like, I just want a place where people can disagree with me to, to speak freely or something like that. Like, right. it's okay to have this debate. And here we have the White House saying, oh, we need a misinformation thing. And I'm just like, whatever. This nice. all is, it's almost like they're doing this. I know, again, I'm trying to be optimistic, but it's almost like they're doing this to, to show how bad things have gotten to wake up the normies. I mean, that's the yeah. only way that I can think of it at this point. Yeah. And you had said the ring, you know, uh, I, I really feel like it's just people saying no moss, you know, like not one more, not one more step over this line. And I think of, um, uh, when, before the Berlin Wall came down, some guy in East Germany had make, made an announcement and he had, I think it had gotten lost in translation or something. But anyway, the people in East Germany said, oh, we can go through to the West now. And they all just went through. Well, they weren't supposed to go through. You probably know this story. Right, they yeah. just all went through it and the guards were like, uh, what? I guess we can't shoot all these people. So the people went from East to West, you know, hours or days before they were technically legally whatever supposed to go through and nothing happened no bullets were fired and i feel that's how things could be with covid that's how things can be on twitter it's COVID. It, yes if it's more exactly people just saying. saying things you know doing things hey well they say it so i can say it. it's just lighting a fire under people who are scared for sometimes very good reasons but just like no mas we're done and that's kind of how i look at elon you know he's done the little counter signaling but whatever so far i haven't seen anything but celebrations of speech coming out of our ears so it so far it's pretty good <laughs> so i'm in california and and the even the act of not wearing a mask not to, today as much but that was i know it's crazy oh i don't want to make the comparison to walking through the berlin wall i know that was right. a different situation but just not wearing it into the grocery store when of course there's signs everywhere and then employees are accosting me all the whole mm -hmm. time. I'd, I never got in anyone's face. I was just very polite about it. And I, I didn't wear a mask. And I feel like that was, I think people would see that. Maybe some would be upset by that. But again, I am here. I'm in California. Yeah. Actually, California has some of the better free, you wouldn't think of it, uh, this, but you, we actually have some of the better freedom of speech laws in the country compared to other states. And I, I do feel comfortable as a result in a lot of the, the songs that I've sung. Um, some people have mentioned that some of the topics that I have sung about, even as a clear joke, uh, would be enough to maybe get me thrown in jail in another country, like a Germany, right. Austria, places yes. like that. Um, and that to me is just, it's so shocking, but at the same time, they were able to shut down the world for two years. So over something that wasn't what it was. And I, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time being shocked at this point anymore. I, right. I, I mean, they're going to, they could fake an alien invasion on the front lawn of the white house, which they probably are they're waiting to do. Uh, and I, I, I would be like, yeah, okay. Yeah. That's the next thing they're going to do. So right. I, it's going to take a lot to really, to surprise me I, COVID Although I expected it, a COVID-like situation, I didn't expect it to go as full as they did. I think part of me thinks that it was done too early. And I mentioned this in my pandemic dance song or something wasn't ready. And it was one of the too cards much. that they had to whip out mm -hmm. and they threw it out there because they needed to do it. They needed to get Trump out. They needed to stop the Hong Kong protests, the yellow vest protests in France, all this stuff that was, there was, I felt this catalyst happening. And then they're like, uh, 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 and they shot us back. You know, they, they needed to, to put us back. But I think ultimately it backfired in that now, sure. A lot of people got, they, they got messed up psychologically and some permanently, unfortunately, but other people who never would have questioned anything. I can't tell you how many times I would just be reading random Reddit comments, for example. And I, I would say, you know, I got my flu shot every year before COVID. And I'm never going to do this again. I'm never going in anymore. And I just, every time I see something, I'm like that. It's a little bit, I'm like, you know, I think that sometimes we have to be, humanity has to be pushed to the absurd to really 
get that fighting spirit that we that all that in, the instinct that we all have to get it to come out. And and the, the, so, so, history is that uh, the cycle of ups and downs of us this pushback and the back and forth. And and right now we're at one of those sketchy points in the middle of this this turning. So. Um, it's fun. It's fun. I try to, I try to try to have fun. I don't know. It's depressing. It's intense. It's overwhelming, but it's also exhilarating. Yeah. Not boring. Not boring. That's right. May so, you live in interesting times. Right? <laughs> so you had uh, said, I think it was in our email exchange that when you realized the world went full clown, you decided to, you decided to start writing songs about it. And here we are. What was that realization? Was it the vaccine thing from long ago? Or was it something else that made you go, aha, I'm inspired. Clown world is at peak. This well, is it. <laughs> I, I mean, I guess, well, in terms of, of being, maybe writing more serious songs, when I go back to 2007, when I'm writing anti-war songs, I think that was my big one for me was first growing up in the 90s was amazing. I, I just absolutely loved it. It was awesome. And learning about Vietnam War and all this stuff and being like, how did that happen? Like, I didn't, I didn't understand, I didn't understand it. And then fast forward 10 years and seeing my friends like lining up, they wanting to, they want to go to war and fight. And I'm like, wait, guys, like, I thought I just learned, we just learned about this in history that probably this, maybe we need to, we need to think about this. So that was big. And then as I'm listening to Alex Jones, I'm like a 20 year old and, and he's going off about the banks and they're going to do this, the crash, the thing. And then the 2008 crash happens or what, you know, whatever that was. And then I'm like, wait, and this is before I had really started off on my career as an adult, you know, or whatever. And I'm like, do I really want to participate in this? This, this is messed up that this, and they didn't get any punishment. So then seeing Occupy Wall Street happen and then mm -hmm. feeling I supported Ron Paul in 2008. Mm -hmm. That's just how I knew that Obama was a wolf in sheep's clothing back then. And I donated almost a hundred bucks to his campaign as a starving artist. That was a huge <laughs> deal for me. I, I, I thought that there was something really important happening there. And there was, that was a moment where there was this early time and it wasn't left and right. It really didn't feel that way. Cause I came from a very left upbringing and background. I was watching the daily show every day. Like I, wa I watched John Stewart crucify Tucker Carlson uh, on uh, whatever that show was uh, uh, in the early 2000s. And basically he lost his show over and I was cheering uh, Jon Stewart on at the time. And, and now it's incredible to see this shift of just 10, 15 years where Jon Stewart is a joke and his, his show is just collapsed on Apple or wherever he's Apple TV or whatever. And Tucker is like one of the most important um, information uh, sources uh, that you could have. And again, this is not just left and right thing like Tucker's like yeah I was wrong about the Iraq war and I'm like yeah you were and then now you can admit that but um, John Stewart's never come out and say hey I was wrong about Obama and all the you know all this right. stuff he wouldn't that would never happen and then I, I look at this and I say hey you know what I was wrong about Tucker and here I am I'm watching I'm watching him and and so um I think this process happened to me for a long time but I was afraid I didn't use my real name on YouTube until I started to play at ragtime festivals. And then I was like, oh, I might as well use it. And then I toured with a band and everything, but I was afraid at first to get it out there. And then foil was the first big one where I sung things like, you know, crazy things, really crazy things in that one. And, and, and I was sort of testing the waters on that one a little bit. And when I saw how badly YouTube, how intensely YouTube um, censored me, I'm like, oh, so that's clearly, a thing. And then I wrote Werner von Braun the next year, where I, I updated the Tom Lehrer classic piece, Werner von Braun, to basically do a laundry list of all the CIA led coups that we've done in the last like 50 years in a song form. And that one got popular, but also suppressed too. And so I, I think it was just a gradual thing over time that I, I, let's put it this way. I blame the normies. I blame the normies for me doing these songs. And let me, let me unpack that. I would just be happy writing pop songs. I I toured with a pop jazz band doing pop jazz versions of Justin Bieber and, and like around the world. And I had a blast doing it. I'm happy doing that, writing musicals. That's, I, I'm, what I like writing songs for kids. Like that's, it's, it's what I like to do. I just, they weren't giving me the time of day for a long time and repeatedly so like i feel like i was 
I got into the worst school that I, I my reject school that like my, I only got into one school of all the colleges. I, I was a straight A student. I was captain of the varsity soccer team. Yes, I was. And I, I had won international piano competitions and I got rejected from basically every school that I applied to, except for one crappy school. And I went there and I lasted for three months as I realized this was just a huge waste of like liberal arts insanity. And I will, I will say in 2003, and I was, this is Oberlin, I will out myself. I, uh, um, one of the worst <laughs> offenders in this, in this, the whole thing. I had no idea at the time when I was getting myself into, I showed up there in 2003 on the, housing application for the co-op that I lived in, there was about a dozen um, genders listed. And I had never seen anything like that. You could, you, you, you could choose which one. And then there were words. And this is 2003. Now, uh, if you think about how long ago that was and how this was, this wasn't an official for the school. This was just a co-op, a student run co-op. And I wasn't necessarily I didn't I was more just this is weird I didn't think it was bad or good or anything I was like, this is different and it's interesting to see how that I felt like those these college campuses this, this liberal arts this this certain environment created what we have seen over the last 20 years and I felt like I was there at the beginning of it or at a certain point of an inflection point of that and I pieced out I was like I don't have anything to do with this so um leaving leaving school and then uh, trying to uh, to figure out how to make I, I wanted to just play ragtime piano I wanted to, to work with schools and everything and I had my kid and all that and then I tried to run a ragtime music festival in, in where I live in, in, in my town and it's just the the, the grants two years in a row I got denied at the last second and I ended up losing thousands of dollars of my own money and it was fine I, I loved the experience I just will never do it again but I directing a festival was one of my great achievements in life, along with touring the world as well, and being a dad. Um, but uh, I, I feel like at a certain point, I was so, I was so over it. I felt, I felt like I'd done everything. I'd given everybody, like people, what I felt like they would, that would I didn't want to be huge. I'm not like trying to be Elton John here. I'm just trying to like make it have a career, even have one local gig. I was playing at at the, uh, the shopping mall locally. I was playing at a bar locally, having a blast. And I just eventually got fired from all of them. Not fired, but like they, they couldn't support it. They wanted me to just to play for tips. They couldn't afford, nobody, nobody pays tips anymore. No, there's no cash anymore. And so there was, they, the, the bar said, oh, we need a, we, we want to have, the piano's taking up too much room. All this, I just kept losing one more. And eventually I had basically nothing left except for my church gig. That was the one thing that I could go, I could rely Jesus ain't going nowhere as a church musician. You're lucky. You, 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 you keep those jobs because it can't, I'm lazy. You know, I, I, I'm, you know, I show up late to gigs. Uh, you don't, you're not late for church. You are there <laughs> in your seat and, and, or else you're out of a job. And it was good for me to have that, that, that structure and everything. Mm -hmm. And then taking it away with COVID, it was just, I'm not, not to make it a, you know about me or anything, but it was so hard for me to see I can't even imagine the people that that was their only sense of community you know, to go to, the, to church or whatever. Right. And, and, and so I, I realized that I needed to do something else. I mean, I could, I couldn't, it's too late in my career to find a new career. I'm still trying to be a dad. You know, my daughter's mom is still traveling. I got to be around for her all the time, but I, I can't, I, I can't do any gigs. So again, to get back to what, what we were saying, I felt forced algorithmically to do what I'm doing to make it. And maybe that's what I would tell like a judge. I'm sorry, your honor. I did. I wrote these spicy songs because I had to, but um, I feel like I was put in this position where I tried everything that I could. And then I, and here I am November of last year. I'm like, Oh, I, I, I saw that Dave Chappelle controversy. That was the moment when I, when I said, wait a second, this guy's like the most famous comedian in the world and he's still getting attacked and almost mm -hmm. removed by Netflix, you know, over this thing. And I thought, I want to see, I was like, I'm going to try this. I want to see if this can, it was almost like, I was like a test. It's like, is this real? Is this real that, that Dave Chappelle and it's completely tame, his stuff that he was saying it is yeah. not even bad. And so I thought I'm just going to write a tame song and it's going to be called, you will never be a woman. And then again, the rest is history. So right. I feel like there was this, there's this moment and people, they, they, they pushed us too far. 
we wouldn't be doing this if if they had just stopped at like at whatever it was that they you know no, that the kids the everything that they have done it's gone so far and again maybe that's what we needed at this point to get everybody to wake up well i'm happy to see that you are so um optimistic because you know there's demoralizing aspects artistically which you've told us about you know the struggles financially you know just being a pianist in general i'm sure even before clown world was probably a hard thing to do but the church thing that's um this was your church like you weren't just an employer um, employee there is this well so as i mentioned that i was an atheist okay um i got this gig because it was my high school music teacher it was his church okay so he i started working on there off and on almost 20 years ago and then i i returned when i i i lived on the east coast for a couple years 2009 2010 and then i um came home to california and had a kid and then needed a little more of a stable situation and then i called up my music teacher and then he said hey we need we need a full-time organist so i joined um, not as part of the congregation, Got it. but I definitely felt, oh, I mean, my daughter grew up in Sunday school at this church that I, that I went to. And I am, um, the church is Episcopal. And so they have a, a little, some things that I'm like, the, the, some of the ritual aspects that I'm, that I'm not as a fan of, but just, just the experience, just the, the experience of, of playing music for people as they have a spiritual understanding or, or, or experience or whatever that it is you can't describe it it's it's, it's amazing it, it it's more than just you know i'm having i'm having my own moment too but i'm providing something it's a sacred task um I, maybe i'm biased because i'm you know as a church organist but i feel like we have an important the mute there's a reason why these gorgeous cathedrals from hundreds of years ago part of it essential was this massive organ uh the organ is the loudest sound that you can make from any instrument without amplification and they tuned these cathedrals uh, and this is gets sort of into the occult aspect of, of things but to essentially be consciousness enhancers and organs themselves have an occ very interesting occult purpose or a role to play in that and a, a good organist is essentially they know this they know the, the spiritual aspects of what they were doing and how certain chords and certain harmonies can resonate and cause vibration. And, and it, like these cathedrals are basically harmonic resonators and the organ is a central part of that. Um, so I felt really over the years, it started out as a gig, just, I guess my, it's my church gig. And it became much more to me in that this was almost a, a duty that, that, that I had to provide people with this experience. And then it was one of those things that I didn't realize, like probably with a lot of people with COVID, how important it was to me until it was taken away for over a year and a half of no church services, no playing for anybody. The only times that I got to play for people was really just on streams. And that's just not a thing. I mean, I, lo I loved, I liked being forced to I, I, I was a ragtime piano guy. And the last thing I, I was going to do was start to be a streaming pianist. That's just, I'm like, oh, I'm like there's no way I'm going to do that. But then I found myself being forced to stream and figuring out how to do that, engaging with virtual people and actually developing some amazing relationships with people and, and how that is now a part of what I do now. But the, to take away that live performance, playing in church, that was, it was a hard, it was, a, it hurt. It was a deep wound. And um, I can't even imagine the people that that was their everything. I can't, it's, it's a, it's a crime against humanity, but multiplied infinitely. I can't even think of anything worse than what we've gone through the last two years, really. I mean, I'm sure there are, I mean, nuclear devastation, sure. But in terms of psychologically, and yeah. spiritually, this is just, it's just the worst. It was definitely, um, psychological, uh, martyrdom is, uh, what a lot of people, um, say I'm an Orthodox Christian and there's, uh, uh, a guy we like from California um, named uh, Father Seraphim Rose, who died back in the 80s, I think. But he talked about how uh, it will be psychological martyrdom that people have to live through in the end times, not yeah. so much physical. And I think there was some of that going on definitely through the COVID. I think stuff. it still is. I yes. think we are still in the thick of that. Yeah. I think we are. Yeah.
And I think part of the cycle, the psyop is us thinking, oh, it's done. The nests are done and anything can happen. Anything. But, but uh, I, I hate it that your that church did that to you because it wasn't just the mandates. It was the uh, the, the song. What's it, the name so of the song? The, the, I, you will never, I, be, a never woman. be a woman. So the church and I, I, again, and there's a lot of places that did worse things. So I don't want to like rag on them too much. They provided me a, a, a great space for a lot, for many years. Um, th- what was very disappointing, I think, they, they were probably going to be fine with having me remain unvaccinated. Um, I don't think they, they just assumed that I was, they never asked for proof. And I never oh. really said anything, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. When they were going to open up again, they were going to require it, require it for children to get into church. And that was something that I thought had only was like Canada was doing. I couldn't, that was crazy. I knew that they were doing um, vaccine passports in some other places in California, not certainly not in my hometown. We, you can go into the grocery store. I mean, the, the, the aquarium nearby, I think you have to have it if you're, if you're 12 or whatever, but the church was trying to do it just to enter the building. And I, when I found that out, I, and this was after maybe I was going to quit over this, ma- the, the mask thing. And then the, you'll never be a woman thing. And then they, they said that, in other words, my daughter wasn't going to be able to come in right. that church. And I, I sort of freaked out at them. I was just, <laughs> I, they, they, I couldn't believe it after everything we were trying to negotiate all that stuff. And I just, I, I just lost it. And, and I, and I, they tried to accommodate and then say, oh, okay, we'll just do 12 and up now that need, they were trying to say five and up needed the vaccine to get in. And this is before, this is before they had like approval. I mean, I'm not even sure what they were thinking. Right. And so then they were trying to work with me and like, okay. And, uh, and I'm like, I can't enter this building. If you're going to have a vaccine passport to get in here, like I I'm fine with people getting the shot and wearing masks, but the whole point of this space is to welcome everybody. And yep. by saying this, you are, you are denying your rights. I believe to be here. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't even be there. I, I do think maybe it's the oldest church in town. It's 150 years old. It was sitting there when there was just farmland around it. So it's sad. I felt, I, I felt like it, it lost something. Um, I, I, I don't want to, to disparage um, this to him too much, but when the rector came in about five years ago, the first thing he did was put an, like an LGBT flag out in front of the church. And it made a lot of families leave the church um, at the time. And I was just like, whatever. I mean, I'm in the thick of it where I am. Like, the, I remember there, there was like the pussy hat parade was happening outside <laughs> at the time. And I'm like rolling my eyes at the whole thing. And like, just the living through the whole, the Trump era. And by the way, welcome back Trump to, to, to social media. Today. <laughs> yeah. Just posted uh, again. I think we're in this, this shift now. And, yes. and um, so, and here we are. I mean, I love that we're, I'm finishing an album right now. Right. Uh, the Twitter thing happened just a few days ago. I'm getting, this is my first serious interview that I've ever done as foundering really, which is kind of, kind really? of exciting. For me. Yeah. Yeah. That's shocking. Like, well, I, I, I don't know. I, pre, I, like, <laughs> I wasn't even on the map as, as really six months ago. So let's put this into perspective. I had 6,000 YouTube followers in November and now I have 12, I've doubled it in six months. So I, I just, I did, I was, there was something stopping me from breaking through and I don't know what it was. Um, and I, I still am at that point where I feel, right. but I, I, like I said, I like, I like, I'm happy. I would like to have a more of a, I need, I lost my source of income and that's why I'm now I'm on subscribe store. Right. And I'm like having to do all this change. I'm happy just giving my music for free. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to, my album, which is almost done. I'm charging uh, 9 11 for it because of, for obvious reasons right I, can, I would just give it for free but it's a conspiracy album so i have to charge 9 11 for it um but i'm going to just upload it all onto youtube um all the songs as videos so anybody if, some, can, if we wanted to buy it it would be through subscribe store is that where people no, pay for gum, the gum road so, that's where you purchase stuff okay so subscribe star is like the patreon alternative um Ooh. i never was on patreon um i remember when the whole and it was like Gamergate, like the whole era that happened. And then a bunch of people got kicked off of Patreon. I think like Milo Yiannopoulos, I can't even remember. And I'm like, okay, I'm never going to do Patreon. And then subscribe star showed up and say, hey, we're not going to ban people for yada, yada, yada. Okay. So I, I never um, signed up for it because I didn't have the audience for it. But then six months ago, I said, hey, I might as well. So I 
popped on um, on Sab's subscribe star and people they that pay is- I guess five dollars a month and then I will put like up a you I'll put up videos before like so they got to see what I'm working on and I've been sharing my album um, early versions to people on subscribe star uh, but all of my music I sell on Gumroad since since uh, Patreon did did me dirty I, I I'm on Gumroad so um when does your album come out um maybe <laughs> maybe today maybe tonight um okay. uh, I I am uploading all 20 tracks starting May 1st, one a day on YouTube. So May 1st, the first one, May 2nd, we're going to go till May 20th. So May 1st is when I'm going to share it into YouTube, et cetera. Uh, But I will probably get it up on Gumroad uh, by tonight or tomorrow. Being that it's uh, 9 $9.11, it's the satirical songs. So, oh. um, Yeah, what's the content? Yes. Okay. So the great. Thanks for asking. I suppose I should explain that. Um, it's I, I would want to buy it anyway, but go ahead and so tell me what's all, on it. It's all. It's the satirical. It's the it's the conspiracy. Um, when I dropped out of college uh, in two thousand and five, I got um, I had my little Mac uh, iMac laptop, and I got Pro Tools, and all of a sudden I had the ability. Pro Tools is a really nice, fancy um, recording software. At least at the time, it was way better than anything I'd ever used before. And all of a sudden, I could do fancier versions of all of my songs that I had written since I was, you know, little, 15, 16, 17. And I sat down and I recorded, I made four albums of some of my best work, um, I think, um, in 2005, straight, four months in a row, four albums. It was crazy. The hardest I'd ever worked in my life. And I just made um, versions of all the songs that I had written over the last five years or so. The same thing has happened now where I haven't made an album since 2011. And I just, there hasn't been an interest in, in it really. I've been making YouTube videos, that's fine. But then all of a sudden I've had people being like, hey, I would love to buy this, but the YouTube quality is just, it's so bad. It's just, your, it's on your, you know, I'm happy to spend the, for just the, the, the tablet. I mean, I'm recording on my tablet for a lot of these, you know, straight, it's just terrible, right? And I feel badly for people. And they're like, I wish I had a studio version of this. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll eventually I'll get in. So finally I, I sat down and I'm like, all right, I'm just going to get over myself and just, right? It doesn't have to be perfect. It's just make nicer versions of all these songs mm-hmm. that people are listening to. So they don't have to download these crappy YouTube versions. So I went back the last 10 years and I took all of my favorite spicy and satirical songs and I found about 20 of them and I recorded wow. them. Yeah, I know. I, I was so, I was way too ambitious. It's, it's two hours of music. I, I don't know. What For 9-11, that is a bargain. Yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, people can, people, Gumroad allows you to pen, um, spend more if you want, but 9-11, it's got to be for symbol, like all yeah. of my like track name, the, the, the song Foil that I do, um, the cover is nine minutes and 11 seconds long on the album. And right. the video is as well. So all these things, it's all I like to do is kind of like inside joke with myself. So yeah, 20 song, uh, 20 tracks, um, s- some silly ones like um, My NPC and Me, which I wrote. I don't know if you've seen that one. It's just a very silly mm-hmm. song about a guy who falls in love with an NPC. Uh, <laughs> it, but back when that was controversial, I remember in 2018, when I wrote that, people were like, you're dehumanizing with the, you know, you can't write songs. I'm like, what? I don't, I don't know. So, so um, that one, and then, um, you know, the, the, so the spicy ones like Oy Vey, and I redid You Will Never Be a Woman. I did, I used drums. It's not like, um, I'm, I'm not a professional. This was more like me re, relearning how to record uh, uh, the stuff, instead of just sitting in front of a piano. Like I've, I've been honing that craft, the performance right. artist, writing songs and performing. It's a whole different shtick spiel ball game than doing that studio recording and and you know using this microphone i got my keyboard i'm using my drum loops and all this stuff and i i don't have the experience i've been reading about conspiracies for the last 15 years not learning how to be a studio (laughs) musician like i only have one lifetime here so this was more like me learning how to do it and and um putting out something that i feel comfortable selling as opposed to just a crappy youtube video and i don't it's a little bit sprawling, but I'm very proud of it. I think it's 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 gonna hold its own, and it's it's got a lot of information in it. Like it really does. Like I, I have a song about molar uh, that goes back four or five years called Molar Time, and I even though it's not as topical anymore, it totally is still relevant because I I go over the whole RussiaGate 
hoax and everything about that and and how just just taking it all apart so there's there's a lot of historical stuff and and i have my pandemic song that one i'm most proud of it's 12 minutes long wow um, my um election fraud is a ele- song is 11 minutes long those are the big ones the election fraud because i had to write a song about the 2020 election i had to do it uh, just like i did for the pandemic uh dance the, the pandemic dance song so just all these songs that i'm proud of it that YouTube has forgotten. Many of them have only a few hundred views. All of them have a YouTube equivalent, essentially. So there's no new material here. But me- most people haven't even heard these because, again, they've exactly. been lost by the algorithm. So I gotta gotta redo them now. And now I'm gonna right. throw them back up on YouTube, and they're gonna get get new life. So. That's right. So what does foundering mean? <laughs> um, foundering is. Uh, I guess it doesn't really mean anything other than it's a term that I just made up for myself in a moniker um, that I, in a song I wrote when I was 15 or 16. Um, and I, I just, it, 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 the, there's a word founder, foundering, and that's what a ship does when it kind of like hits rocks and stuff. Like a ship founders, you don't want to be on a ship when it founders, right? But that's spelled with an E, foundering, foundering. So I kind of took that word and just made it foundering because it just so it takes takes out a syllable and also makes it unique. I wasn't thinking, I wrote that when I was 16 in 2001, maybe. I wasn't being like, oh, this is a unique word that will help me on the Google search algorithm, <laughs> you know, but it's a word that it's, it's unfortunate that it's not something that it, it's someone else is using essentially. So it's, it sits on its own. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, it, it's me, it's foundering is, is, is the songwriter of me, if that makes sense. Okay. But, but Kylan is, is the, I write, um, like I compose, um, and it's weird to talk to myself in a third person, but I compose, uh, uh, rag, ragtime pieces. So when I compose a rag, it's a serious thing. I'm a, com- I, I'm a composer. I don't put foundering there. I, I put, I put my name, right. you know, my, my, as a composer. Right. So the foundering is more just this idea that I had of, of, of me singing songs as a career. And it, it never went anywhere. I, I uh, friends and family were like, yeah, that's great. Now you should get a career and, and uh, you know, <laughs> get so a I, job. <laughs> yeah, get a job. It is real. And, and, and to a certain extent, they're right. Like the world that I was growing up in the two thousands was not friendly to someone like me. Right. Um, and, but then again, Hey, I did, I can't complain too much. Cause I, I got to perform in, in Moscow, in Tasmania, in Singapore, in, in Norway, in, in, in Slovakia, like all these things, these experiences I had, I got to share my music. And that was, it was such an amazing thing. Like I'm a classically trained um, pianist and I, I, I listened to almost all classical as a kid. And every country I went to, it was my opportunity to share the, with the world, like what I, what, you know, my love of what their culture was. So in, um, in, in, in France, I would play, I played French music in, in, in Germany. I played some German in, 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 um, Finland, I played music by, uh, Sibelius, their great Finnish composer. Um, in Grieg, I played music by Edvard Grieg, uh, and sorry, in Norway, I played, um, music by Edvard Grieg, their famous composer in, in, uh, Czech Republic. I played the Moldau, which is their, their most famous classical piece. And you have never heard I, anyone screaming as loud as the maybe 10,000 people or so that was in the, that audience in Czech Republic. When I started playing there, you know, they had just gotten two hours of a show of, of, you know, great, like rock and jazz or whatever. And then I have my solo, right. in my moment, and I'm sitting there and I just start playing the, 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 their piece. Right. And of course my band has no idea what I'm doing. They're like, what is going on here? And, and then the whole place just screams, just erupts, just this, this mad, this, and I was in Moscow. And I played um, Rachmaninoff and Tchaikovsky for them. And they were just, they were just like, it was the mo- like that rock star moment that you have. And I realized that they, this is what they don't want. They don't want the, we were taken out uh, on the town in, and this is 2016 when um, this is before the, the election, right? So Obama's still present before my Russia, Russia, Russia. We were taken around town in Moscow, my band and, we were treated like kings, like the free drinks everywhere. The Americans, oh my God. And everyone <laughs> at the show, they were like, this is the first time that we felt that America has been brought to Russia since the fall of the Soviet Union. That's what people were telling telling us. And this meeting of cultures, and it was all one. And it, it was when COVID happened and I realized I'm not going on tour maybe ever again. Um, 
I realized what that took away from, from us. It's so much more than just, even just traveling. Also, I, me, me going there and having those experiences, I will never forget for the rest of my life. Even if I never tour again, just to having that that one time, it was just, it was life-changing. And, and um, I hope someday that I can do that again. I can go and I can play my spicy songs or pop songs or jazz, like, I don't care. Like I'm, I'm meant to be a performer. And I feel that that was taken from me and uh, in a lot of respects growing up and then now, and I don't want to make it, oh, woe is me, but um, it is a little bit at that point. And, and um, I think that we're in this new turning where I'm hoping that artists like me, smartphones messed us up. Let's just say like, as someone who's played live for so many years, getting tips and everything, it's different now when you can just pull your phone up and then type in amazing piano player and see the most amazing piano player in the world in two seconds. It takes away from the experience of someone who's amazing, maybe not the most amazing player in the world, but still the best that you're probably going to see in a month or two or even a year, you know, but it, it cheapens that experience, I think. And there is this period of, of now I see people falling into that trap of caring less uh, of, the, of the experience that are, that's outside of them. And even now, as I am now starting to maybe play more, I'm playing in this bakery, this local, I'm just, that's my only live gig is in a bakery. Yes, it's, I have a piano ragtime bakery gig. I stream <laughs> there too when I'm on Twitch. People are coming in and they're, they're still not allowed to sit down, which is crazy, right? They got, oh, no, we got to step outside. We can't sit down and listen to music. I got old guys coming in. They're saying, they're just, I just want to listen to him play. And they're kicking him out. It's heartbreaking to me. I can't, I cannot even fathom it. So I'm seeing people, they're like, wow. There's, there's a live piano over there and they're talking like, like I exist. Whereas the years leading up to COVID, I was existing way less and less and less and less and less and less. And maybe it's just this temporary time of people, they have a little bit of renewed interest because they've been starving for so long. But I don't know. I feel like people losing out on this stuff for so long, and it has been long, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a little time, especially in places that are back ass word, like California, like I am, it's going to take a lot of time for people to get out of their shell again. But I, I see this returning with gusto and, and I'm sort of pivoting myself. I'm like testing the waters. I'm like, okay, I think it's going to go this direction. I'm taking a little bit of a gamble by doing what I'm doing, but I don't think I, I don't think it's a huge loss. I may have, I may lose potential gigs. I, I'm sure I've already lost potential gigs <laughs> from what, from my songs, but I, I don't think I think people don't care as much anymore. I think they're yeah. just, I think we're at a point where like this Twitter thing, like people are going to, they need to get it out of their system, say the offensive things or whatever, mm -hmm. the controversial things that, oh, that felt good. Like right. we need to be allowed that go into the room and scream our, our curse, our minds out. If you cut people off, if you close people in on themselves, they're going to keep retreating inwards until they inwardly combust. Right. And that's, and that, or they're going to go shoot up a school. Or you know what I'm trying to say? Like right. you need to have people be challenged and not be pushed into their echo chambers. Yes, I agree. You know, that's one of the things that drives me crazy about the whole hate speech thing. You know, oh, it leads to violence or speech is violence. And it's like not speaking your mind and getting things off your chest and learning to build a bridge with maybe somebody you disagree with or just uh, agreeing to disagree. That's what keeps violence at bay. And that's why it's so, exactly. um, it's so, uh, heart-wrenching that this hate speech thing is um still has legs but uh well, saying that a song could be hate speech that like, yes like a silly a song a silly song like come on so one of your commenters uh it, it, they were talking about you being from california and uh he, he said, it's so strange that some of the most based people <laughs> live in the most cucked locations. And then this was his question. This is talking about the commenters where they just have these really brilliant uh, moments. When buried by an oppressive environment, does freedom seek air and boil up to a point bursting out like a volcano or a pimple? Is that kind of how you feel sometimes? Yeah, that's ooh, that's that's graphic. I love that. I like I like to think of my songs as like a burst pimple. That's good. I like that. <laughs> let, let the pus ooze out and then spread its love. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I I I I remember I did notice that comment. Um, I feel like um, who was talking about? Oh yeah, um, a salty cracker. I like to listen to salty. You know, you know salty. Cracker. Yeah. He's a, he, he likes to to rant about random things. I think he lives near me. Um, ah. in this area and he complains a lot about 
this this environment and how it it's forces because he used to be a lefty right that's his thing and then it has now completely shifted as being like i think i mentioned earlier going to that church and then the the flag went up and then i'm going outside and there's these pussy hat parade and everyone is just running around i'm like what is <laughs> this and I, I i also remember like because trump had just been elected right and then they were like down with the the trans pacific the tpp right that was the thing and that the signs were oh, like i'm, I'm thinking that. like that's what trump Trump was the one was going to be taking that down. Like these people didn't even know what they were protesting. Essentially, right. they were holding up signs for the current thing, but they weren't. They didn't even know. So I think seeing that and and the Trump, the the, the TDS that happened was very formative for me and informative as well as, as an artist. Though I, I think it was so it happened so fast and so shockingly that I. I, I was forced to to adjust my whole worldview against the left, uh, liberal ideology, every or whatever you want to call that leftist. I don't even know what it is anymore. Um, and just being surrounded, my family, my friends, with a very few exceptions, it's tough because then you 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 then you're you 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 feel like you're um, an outcast or like I feel like I'm almost guilty. Like I'm like don't like don't I don't want people to know that. And it's not even that I disagree with them about a lot of things. It's just. If they if they knew if people knew like it's it's nice that nobody has any idea that I have a YouTube channel or that I do anything because I I'm much I'm much happier with that I like yes. that I never really had success in my own hometown <laughs> because I would be canceled but I'm not I can't be canceled so right <laughs> well I have millions of followers so your big break's about to come <laughs> oh, so, but, but I always say you know there's a benefit to being small potatoes you know yeah. um you can say a lot of stuff because you know you get noticed sometimes but then it lasts a day you know it doesn't it does. go it, on it, in, perpu it, in perpetuity <laughs> it, it, and it's funny um, what you the last of day thing that it's it's the add nature of the internet and mm -hmm. at, in the beginning it was tough for me because i was like i would get a viral video i remember i had a video get the front page of, of dig.com back in 2000s like if you remember that place and i had a video yeah. get the front page of, of reddit in the early days and um i i remember i'll get all this attention and everyone's reaching out oh i want to collaborate blah 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 and it would be gone in about 48 hours. Yeah. It was like you would be unless you put out content every week or more than that. And good I'm like, this is gonna be exhausting. I cannot keep up with this. If people are gonna forget about me in a week, there's no way this is sustainable for me. Right. So <laughs> so um fast forward to now, um where I feel well, I I, I like that challenge. I mean. I'm going to use that to my advantage now because I don't necessarily want my very controversial songs to get, if, if they get popular, like they did um, uh, uh, the Oy Vey song, YouTube's just going to delete it. Right. Um, I, I want it to be forgotten. Like when my church was like, Hey, you wrote this song. Um, you will never be a woman. It's super offensive. And I, and I told them, and this was the one thing that I was wrong about when I, when I had my meetings with them before I left, I said, the internet's going to forget about this song in a week. I told them that. And to a certain extent, I was right because it was gone for it. it no one cared for about a month until it got picked up. Oh, and then that. now <laughs> YouTube admits that it has about 60,000 views. Right. If YouTube is admitting that that video has 60,000 views, then it has way more than 60,000 views. So I, I, I have to be careful. I don't want, I like that the internet is forgetting about after about a week because I'm doing right. stuff now that I'm, like even a day or two later, I'm like, oh, did I just do that? <laughs> like, I'm feeling a little bit, you know, like I have these, like I just made a, a song called, I did a cover of an Alex Jones rant. Um, <laughs> I watched it with my children. Oh my God. <laughs> they're, they're teenagers, they're teenagers. Okay, so so like, I, have a I could tell by the title, it was going to be uh, spicy. <laughs> so there's certain things that like my daughter, <laughs> she sings along on a lot of my album uh -huh. tracks, but there's some that, Actually, most of the songs on the album I'm fine with, but there's certain things that I have to be careful. I'm a dad and I'm like, I have to be aware, aware of this. I'm more, yeah. I'm more worried about that than what people on the internet think of me. Right. Like, that's like, that's more important to me, like is just being a good role model and, and stuff like that. And it's, yeah. it is funny when she sings along with some of my songs too. I'm like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cause I was like, I didn't quite understand it. And then I searched it. I was like, 
oh, it's a whole Alex Jones thing. Right. So that one is a very specific right. thing. So that's why I take risks doing that, right? Mm-hmm. That is a very clearly inside joke. And a lot of these things people aren't going to get, they just, they're not going to get, but I don't care. That's what's fun about it. Right. That's right. what is, that's where we're at now. Right. And um, I feel more comfortable. Like the language is now becoming memes. And even the people that never had heard of it, they kind of like, I, okay, this is great. I don't yeah. even know. I don't get it, but this is funny. So yeah, that's what the comments were saying. I'm not sure yeah. what you're doing here, dude, but <laughs> it was funny. Yeah. Um, did you put in the line about the, the drinking of the blood or whatever? Or was that in the original? That's in the original. That's in it the original. It was. Yeah. Okay. Cause yeah. I was like, oh, maybe that's his new like modern twist since like everybody's no, no, drinking no. each other's blood now. Apparently. No, but I did write, I did write my song about Alex Jones uh, called yeah. Alex Jones was right. And yeah. I mentioned adrenochrome and all the fun stuff that he likes to talk about. So, <laughs> okay. I'm going to wrap up by asking my kids questions. Okay. Sure. Because if I don't, and I know um, I've been taking a lot of your time and you have an album to get to mister so okay um what kind of piano do you play like what is like the identity of the piano like yeah. it's like it's, it's or very, style yeah the style or what brand or it just looks very unique the one you play oh, in your videos in the videos okay mm-hmm. so that is like it is a unique one it, it, it's a, i believe it's a Kawhi brand but what it is okay. is actually it's a an acoustic electric um, in that it has a, a electric ports and it can plug in, but mm. it actually has strings. Like, so this, this is just an electric keyboard and it's plugged into an amp right now. It's not, it's just, you know, it's a fake piano sound, right? That actually has strings. So it actually has hammers that are hitting it, hitting the, the notes, um, but it can be plugged in as well. I typically don't for my videos. And the reason is, um, it is half the size of a, of a full grand piano. The strings are not as long um, hmm. and it's not as loud. So it's, uh, I'm in a sort of like an apartment type situation where banging on a piano, like a full grand piano would just be where the whore would be just a, the worst neighbor. I mean, I'm already probably a pretty bad neighbor with some of the songs <laughs> that I'm singing at the top of my lungs in here. I'm, I don't even want to ask what they hear. Um, but um, so it, it allows me to really pound away um, with and, and having that resistance of a real piano with not having to worry about the sound. But when I'm recording videos, um, it's one of the hardest things to do is, is, is a, as a, p- a piano singer um, is f- focusing on that piano and separating your voice from it and then not letting necessarily that piano overwhelm your voice. So I get into it when I play piano, especially the styles that I'm doing these rhythms, this right. ragtime is very heavy in the left hand, right? I'm a ragtime pianist. Um, and, and it helps me when I record the videos the, 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 my, it doesn't drown out my vocals. So it's just okay. like the right piano for, it's not in like the best tuning. It, it is what it is. It, it gets the job done for what I want it to do. Right. Um, so that's, that's what that instrument is. Um, but I, I like my, my piano and I, I'm, I'm partial to just a beat up upright piano upright. I mean, the ones that are flat up against the mm-hmm. wall, not like a grand piano and just the ones that even missing a couple notes. Um, I tend to, like to bring out the, the character and energy of old pianos. I do think they have character. They have stories. They have, I think they like it when I play them because I find the notes that work and I just, just by intuition and I know how to make it sound, know how to make them sound good. So I am, um, I've had this bakery piano gig that I, I've played at for years. I just go in and play piano in this bakery and they, they pay me. They're, they're just absolutely amazing people that to let me do that. Um, and uh, it has this beat up old piano and I just play ragtime piano. And I stream on that. So I, I when I, just so you, if, if, for those who don't know, ragtime is a, is a, is a style of early jazz pre swing era, pre, you know, Louis Armstrong, pre, pre all that 1930s, forties, um, back in t- the 1900s, 1910s, uh, right, right. When you had European harmonies, mixing with sort of the African-American rhythms. That was just, just like this melting pot. That's what America was, right? That's what made us great. And sort of these, all these ideas were joining together and created this new style of music where, it, you know, all the young folks were dancing to it. And in fact, the town I live in banned dancing to ragtime music, literally wow. by law, uh, $100 fine, 30 days in jail if you were caught dancing to ragtime. So it was here... 
I feel like this there's something about it that is at the forefront. What it was doing, it was it was making all all those kids dance with each other and all the old fuddy duddies were like, right. oh no, you know, like <laughs> no, no, they're doing the bunny hop over there, you know, the turkey <laughs> trot. Um, and of course then it, it became old and antiquated by the 20s. Uh, but there was something pioneering about it that was fresh. It was almost like it was America's first original offering, first style. We had the blues that was sort of coming out as well in the late 1800s, but in terms of just a real genre, before jazz, it was ragtime. And there's something that suits my pattern recognition, my ADD a little bit of just the constant bounce and the constant stimulation, the oompa oompa. The, the, it's, ragtime is based on syncopation, which is kind of like on the offbeat. Instead of doing everything in the square time, like square dancing, we're doing you know, on the off beats, right on the, and that's what makes you kind of want to dance. That's ragged time. That's why it's called rag time. Ragged time mm. is the time is a little bit ragged, right? So there was something about that pioneering controversial aspect of it that I felt, I guess it really suits this, these spicy songs. It's, it's this style of, of, of playing and not many do it. It's that you, you wonder why there aren't more of us piano guys and gals doing what we're doing. It's the classical style doesn't really teach you how to do that oompa loompa ragtime style and modern jazz is just way too cerebral i mean it's great and i love it i can never i can't do it but um it's it's too often its own little world and it's forgotten the sort of rhythmic fun the left hand that's what it is it's the left hand that is so powerful and important in the in the ragtime because think about it in the 20s in the teens, you, you you didn't necessarily have the money to afford a full band, right? So your your piano player had to step up his game. He had to learn how to do the bass part, that some of the drum, the, the and the piano is a percussive instrument, right? In general, so this school of musicians, sort of this piano man, all in one minstrel type performer, has gone to the wayside. I mean, people aren't really doing this anymore. And I felt like there's this, this niche for me to sort of this, this vacuum to fill. There's other people that do it, you know, the, the Bo Burnham's types, uh, that, but they're more for like the normies, right? I, I'm trying to, there's Tom Lehrer. He's the guy, right? He's Tom Lehrer was writing satirical songs in the 60s. My parents listened to him. He was calling out um, uh, the pedophilia among the elites, like in the 60s in his songs, like in ways I'm like, how did he get away with it? You know, I look back at the Smothers Brothers and all these guys that were doing this controversial stuff that got canceled. They were the, they got canceled for questioning the, the Vietnam War. I mean, that's what I want to aspire to. I want to be, artists are supposed to be the ones that are going against it. We've forgotten, you know, we got Neil Young and all the Joni Mitchell coming out and being like, hey, man, 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 you guys have to censor. And you are supposed to be the, the pioneers of the, the countercultural movement. And so where are we now? It's, it's now, it's, it's us on the fringes of the internet that we are the ones that have to be doing their job that folks like, um, you know, Neil Young should be doing. And sure, folks like Eric, Eric Clapton and even like Roger Waters from Pink Floyd, they're speaking out and they're doing, they're speaking truth to the power, but there's not as many as there, there could be and should be. And maybe, once things are shifting with this Twitter and all this stuff, it, these celebrities who they have a lot of sway, they're going to feel more emboldened to speak their truths. And I, I think I think I just saw a quote, Kid Rock saying how there are far more conservative types in Hollywood than they will ever admit. Right. They will ever admit. And they just once that once this thing shifts, it's, it's going to be really more apparent. And I'm that's why I'm putting my my hopes on that and that to that respect. Now, did you get into ragtime? Was it something you had an appreciation for and then you saw the niche or? No, since I was first? a kid. Okay. It, there was this period of time when nobody played ragtime. Um, the, the movie, The Sting really brought it back. And that was in the 1970s. Huh. I don't know, yeah, Robert yeah. Redford. Mm -hmm. um, and they used ragtime music as the soundtrack. Right. And there was this huge interest in the, it was called the ragtime revival in the seventies. In fact, some ragtime musicians say, Hey, they're still making their careers off of the sting because that's still pushing them along. It's amazing how just one movie in the seventies could right. do something like that to an entire genre of music. So there was that time and my dad got way into it. But then in the nineties, when I was growing up, there was nothing, there was nothing. And I found my dad's collection of Scott Joplin, who's like the ragtime mm -hmm. composer, a Maple Leaf Rag, the entertainer. Um, 
his pieces and I loved reading music. I was good at sight reading. So I just started playing it when I was maybe eight or nine and I fell in love immediately. And that's almost all I wanted to play for, for, for years. I studied classical, but I just, I ended up going back to ragtime. And I will mention one thing. It is, there is another ragtime revival, but hundreds of times more effective than the sting was in the seventies. And it is happening, not just in movies and TV shows, but specifically in video games. In video games, oh. of all places, kids are being inundated with ragtime. Ragtime is everywhere. I'm. I try not to. You know, we do have our own screen time rules here when we have we play video games. But it's amazing how often I hear my daughter playing a game, and I'm like, that is straight ragtime. What I'm hearing, of course, the the, the game isn't saying, hey, kids, you're learning ragtime, but they're being exposed to it. I mean, think about even. Even like um, uh, the Mario from 19, the 1980s, you have, uh, you know? That's true. This is all ragtime, 100%. Mario is almost all ragtime music. They're not calling it that. Right. But we're, a whole generation of kids is now being exposed to this, this to the style of music and loving it and growing up with it. And I mentioned earlier, um, the pianist named Tom Breyer. He's probably the most famous living ragtime um, composer and pianist. Um, I saw his videos back in 2008, 2009. He's just sight reading um, uh, Mario music, but playing in his ragtime style wow. and getting hundreds of thousands of views, even millions of views. Uh, and I, I was like, this is it. This is it. This is how we're going to keep this musical. Here I am thinking no one's ever going to listen to you know, ragtime again. And I'm seeing people on YouTube playing it for millions of people. So in 2007, I'm like, I got to do this too. And then a number of years I, I later, I ended up meeting Tom um, and becoming very close with him. I stayed over at his house a whole bunch of times. I went, we, he, he taught me a whole bunch and he, he was a huge mentor of mine. He's probably the greatest living sight reading piano player. And when I say sight read, I mean, you put a music in front of someone and they play it for the first time without ever seeing it before and even coming up with it. Uh, new versions like ah, on the spot. It's it's very difficult skill. And one that I have tried to cultivate as much as possible. I take try to take after him. So I, I, I felt like I tried to learn from him. Unfortunately, he um, was in a, in a tragic car accident a number of years ago and had a brain injury um, and lost his ability to play mostly 90% pretty much. And oh my he probably will never play again. So it, I think of, of the things, tragedies that have happened in terms of the, the world of music, that's the biggest tragedy that's happened in the last 50 years, um, if not longer, uh, just because of how important I feel he was, not just to ragtime, but just to random Joe Schmo on the internet, just a total nerd, total dork, but becoming a celebrity. I mean, people know this guy all over the internet. He's, he's well, quite well known. And the fact that I'm even associated with him, it gives me huge, uh, I, I, that's like a major um, uh, prestige for me to be able to say that I'm even acquainted with that guy. So just that idea of that someone could just to do that and, and give so many people such inspiration. I see people say, hey, I started playing piano because of because of Tom Breyer, you know, and and I, I'm like, I got to get a piece of that. I got to do that. I want to show the next generation of kids that you can still learn something. You can play your video games and all that, but having an actual tangible skill with your hands that you can do as an artist or whatever is, is irreplaceable. It, 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 and, and we we can't we can't forget that as we, the machines are going to be replacing us. We're, mm -hmm. we're never going to a machine is never going to write a song like you will never be a woman. I'm not trying to say, right. oh, that's a great <laughs> song. You know what I mean? Like there's something that we have that the machines can't quite right. do and they're never going to be able to do. Yes. And we need to just we need to not be intimidated by the streaming and all that. And I'm speaking to myself, too, you know, but we need to be inspired by it and embrace it and not give ourselves into it and not. Go fully the other direction, but to make it, to take it and make it our own and then yes. return it to the people. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make it my own, but then give it back. So my kids have been playing my eldest son for, I think, 10 years. And then his uh, younger twin brothers wow. for seven and a half. So back to their questions. Well, let me tell you first one thing that I like what you were just saying about using your hands, but doing something with piano. Um, you know, that's kind of how we've been thinking. Um, do you want to 
you could do piano tuning. You could play someplace for tips if they still have cash. Right. Uh, you could teach lessons. You could compose. You, we've talked about composing for video games and I didn't that even know about the amazing. ragtime thing. It, the, the, that is the next big thing. Mm -hmm. um, this is going to sound a little weird, but the classical music of this era in the future is mm -hmm. the video game music, mm -hmm. the soundtrack right now. Does that like make sense? Like Minecraft so, music and all that. It's so always hundred like, oh, percent. I like the this kid, music. <laughs> the gender, the Zoomers that are growing up right now, in fifty years, they are going to. They're not going to turn on the Beatles. They're not going to turn on Tchaikovsky. They're not going to turn on Beethoven. They're going to turn on the video game soundtracks from this era, and not. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because a lot of the great talent right now is going mm -hmm. into that field. So they're not writing music for movies and, 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 and TV shows anymore. They're writing music for video games now. And it is, I mean, my daughter, that's what she, she's like, dad, I want to write music for video games. I'm like, that would be great. Like, that's hey, cool. I want to write music for video games. I would, <laughs> I would love that. If I could do that, that would be amazing. So I think you were right. And that, yes, the skill is, is you got to have your fundamentals, but then it's, you don't have to choose one path. Like yeah, I, I saw when I, I was at college, it's like, everyone was like, oh, I'm going to be a classical musician. I'm going to be a jazz musician. I'm like, I'm going to sing silly songs. Like I don't right. really, like, there's so many possibilities here. And the teaching is a huge aspect of mm -hmm. it. Like I, um, my briefly, my daughter, when, when the school shut down, we started this independent little study thing up in the mountains, like way up in the mountain. We had to drive. We don't, I don't have her anymore because it was too much driving. Um, but it was amazing experience. This, uh, you know, I, I, everyone shut down. Right. And then the people who were still sane were like, wait, no, we need to have our kids still like go to school. So we threw them in this, threw her in this little situation with these kids um, up in the woods and they're, they got animals out there and they're learning all this stuff. It's amazing. A beautiful place. And I'm, I still go up there once a week. Uh, to teach music. So I, I was just up there today. I brought my accordion. I'm playing my, I was playing Legend of Zelda, like walking through the the, the woods, like on my accordion. It's wow. such a cool experience. And I'm, I'm teaching them um, Tom Lehrer songs. So we were singing Poisoning Pigeons at the park. And today I taught them the Irish Ballad, which is a very morbid, but hilarious song. And, <laughs> and it's a group of um, six to 12 year old kids, about 10 kids. And, and just and, and here I am, like, I was like, you know, I really should be working on my album today. And then I'm like, but that hour or two hours, that, that time for those kids, it's so much, it does so, even though it's such a small school, they're going to take these experiences with them and remember them for the rest of their lives. Like that crazy guy and that come up and sung songs <laughs> about poisoning pigeons on his accordion. Like they're, they're like these little feral kids running around barefoot, like doing carpentry and stuff. And, and like, but they're all jumping into the music room and they're all gathering around singing about pigeons. And it's just like, clearly this is what, I mean, I'm meant to do. I'm meant to be a teacher. Like I, I was a soccer coach for a while. Like that was one of my, my jobs growing up. So I like taught kids for a while, but just the next generation needs it in a big way. And now more than ever, because COVID took two years of our lives, but that doesn't, that's not just two years. That's, multiple generations of kids that didn't choose music or the arts because they mm -hmm. didn't have the opportunity. And right now there's going to be this gap of a huge one of emotional and, and all sorts of trauma damage from, from, from these kids that didn't experience it. And so that's why we have to come back with gusto to make yes. sure to undo some of that damage. And, and so that's, I mean, I'm, I hope that I can do that. I mean, that's the schools, like I can't even teach in schools. I mean, they're still mostly masked here. And like, it's, I'm in, I'm in a bad situation in terms of COVID, but um, it's changing. People are lining up. So I'm, I sort of, I've got over COVID a while in terms of worrying about like other people that was, I'm just worried about other people. I'm yeah. like, trying to make them feel better. I wanted to go to church and play for people in church and it, it, it is what it is. So instead, I, I, I learned how to write spicy songs. So and here we go are. to the mountains. I'm so glad you have that outlet in the mountains. So one of the reasons my kids uh, saw your newest spicy video, um, what's the name of it? Um, 
I'm gonna eat a leftist. I will. I will eat your leftist ass. Right. And <laughs> like it's corn a, on the cob. Yeah. Right. And it's, it's, it's a cover. It's what Alex Jones said. Yes. It's Alex Jones rant that I put into music form. Yeah. Yes. Did a ragtime version. It was so great. But anyway, part of their homework today was because they're musicians and I'm not. Was to watch some of your videos and come up with questions. So, just a, a just a couple more. What key do you play ragtime in? Is it always in the same key? Um, good question. Um, this isn't always true, but flats, you have flats and sharp. So like sharp as you go up and a flat as you go down, right? This is for, for those who maybe not as familiar with music, the blues in general and, and jazz likes flats. It likes flats as opposed to sharps that gets into a little like more metaphysical discussion of why that might be, but we, there's like the blue note, like that, the idea of that. And, and when we have our, 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 what's called a dominant seven chord, we bring a, a, a note and we bring it flat. So flats in general work well with ragtime, but in particular, the styles that I play, the keys that have just a one or two flats in them. And to get technical, we're talking F major, B flat major, E flat major, and A flat major, particularly E flat major and A flat major, I would say. Um, those have the right amount of flats that it just feels so nice on the piano. Like, it, it just, it flows so nice. And it, and, and um, it, it's this, it's that back and forth. It's that right combination of black and white keys. Whereas if you're just trying to play in C major, which is all white keys on the piano, if you just go, if you want to play in C major, you just go white, white, white keys. You kind of, you don't have the same grip as you do with those black keys give you this extra kind of hold. And if it's the right combination, it works really well. So ragtime, I'm loving E flat, I'm loving A flat. How do you decide what key to compose in your, wonderful your original question. songs? They're gonna be so proud you've said Wonder the last two questions wonderful, for wonderful. Wonderful question. Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, I could talk about this for another you know, two hours, <laughs> uh, the, the, sort of the idea, like musical metaphysics is really what it is. Um, this certain keys feel super right. Um, obviously, if I'm a singer, it's going to have to fit my range. And I'm going to want those high, the highest notes to be just at the high end of my range and the lowest notes to be just at the lowest end so that it sounds nice and effective. So that it doesn't sound like, sound like I'm straining for one or the other. But Generally, I will know if the piece is right uh, in the right key because it feels right. And also, if you're doing a key change, which can be um, effective, you know, you move up at the end, you know, oh, it's you kind of feel it, even if you're not a musician, oh, it just got higher or something. Mm -hmm. and you want to work <laughs> that into your piece. Um, but usually, I almost feel like certain keys have different characters. I don't know if that sounds a little too esoteric, but a lot of famous classical composers like, I think Chopin, his favorite key was E or D, D flat major. And uh, there's different colors, you know, I don't necessarily have synesthesia. That's when you, when your senses kind of mix together and you see, you hear colors or whatever, but each key has a personality for me and a certain song will not work in B flat for me. Like it's, it's just not the right temperament for B flat. B flat is more like silly and goofy and boisterous as opposed to D flat, which is a lot more melodic and beautiful. Even though these notes are just the same, they're all just major scales. There's just, there's something that is not tangible that music taps into. That's why people love music, young and old and uh, whatever culture you're in. Why, when I toured around the world, I brought their music, I, I show them their music, but in my style, in my own way of flavor, but it was the universal language, you know, like um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind when the aliens yeah. come and they go, no, 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 no. It's, 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 that's how we communicate is with these, these extra sensory feelings. So yeah, like um, a, a key, it, it, it will click. If, it, if it's the right key, it, it's, it's the right key. And sometimes it might take me a few tries until I figure out which one works. Do you start with the lyrics first or music or does it go back and forth? I know you said you thought of some lyrics in the shower the other day. That's sometimes where I have my best um, ideas too. Yes. And then I get out and then I'm old and I forget. I wish I had like a waterproof pad in the shower or something. For sure. And I, that's, that's why I'm actually really grateful for this new songwriting approach. I hadn't been writing songs for years, really, except for pandemic dance. That was more out of necessity. But in the last six months, I've written more of some of my best songs I think I've ever written. 
in such a short amount of time. And it's, it's like stunning to me, but part of it is I'm, I'm like, knock on wood. I hope it continues. Like I say, who knows? I might not write songs for another three years after this, but um, I think part of it is getting it out there and just throwing it up on YouTube as quickly as possible or wherever online, you know, before I forget it, because I, a oh. lot of this, you know, you, you, you just, you come up with these ideas and then they're in and out. And then there's the next thing and the, the internet forgets too. So part of it is more, it's like, I'm keeping a record of these. So I don't, cause I, I went back to, to redo some of my old songs for this album and I forgot them. I forgot the words. I forgot the chords. Oh. I had to relearn these. And I was like, thank God I recorded a video of these. Um, so I, yes, I will come up with an idea like no Russian ever called me a cracker, um, mass formation. Um, you will never be a woman. Usually a meme, like a meme. It's like memes to start the idea, right? Start the process. And then I'll sit down at the piano and then I will just sing it until it works. I will sing the words, you will never be a woman until the timing is right. The sounding is right. Like you will never be a woman. The, the wood goes up as opposed to you will never be a woman. Like that doesn't make sense. You have to, it has to flow with the phrase. So then I, once I get the phrase going, and then the music sort of the music sort of pushes the the words where the words go next and i sort of just start singing and the words will generally kind of form in my mind and be written alongside the music though for the most part the musical ideas get done first and then i flesh out the with the words afterwards so i am a musician first and then a lyricist second i would say so okay. i i the music comes to me supernaturally whereas the words i can I struggle with, I come up, come up with a billion musical ideas forever till the cows come home, but the lyrics are tricky. And that's why I need, I realize I needed this back and forth, this social media engagement uh -huh. that had been denied to me for so many years. I mean, it's, it's one thing if a couple people say, Hey, this is great. That's fine. I need like dozens of comments saying this sucks. This is good. This is bad. Blah, 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 blah. I need the, the whole gamut. And I need them people to say, Hey, you should do one about this and this and this. Yeah. And then it spurs that creativity in me. Like I said, like at first I'm like, Oh, there's no way I'm going to do that song. I'm not going to write a song. No rush. Never call right. me cracker. That's stupid. And then I end up doing it. I'm like, this is one of my favorite songs I've ever written. Thank God. Like I <laughs> actually went through with that. Like, so it is, it's interesting. How, so, how the creative process works with this this new era of social media are you writing the music down on like on a staff paper or just no. kind of making recordings how are you making sure it gets from your brain into the piano and so the the music back is, to your memory is is is, <laughs> is, is, is in me okay is in me. i never write down music wow um, unless i'm i'm doing a ragtime composition when i'm writing notes for notes okay. i never writ, write down a single note i don't write down chords like i said i'm a musician first so okay. all the music is very innate and fundamental in me, the lyrics are what I struggle with. And I, cause I get lost in the music that you have to, it's a right brain, left brain thing, I think is what it is. And then, and I, to remember the words, I have to stay present in a way. It was so hard as a, as a pianist. That's wild. I was, I thought I was such a good singer at, at 16 and such a good pianist at 16. And then I tried to do them together the first time and it just all fell apart. It was just so bad. I like my recordings back then. I'm just I sound like I'm a, like a dying cat or something. I don't know what is going on. I can't, it's <laughs> two parts of the brain that you're trying to make happen at the same time. And that just took years and years. And that's why you're not seeing young up and coming kids. I mean, maybe they're out there and, you know, 13, 14 year olds who are singing and playing piano and being amazing, doing that is, that takes decades of time to really feel comfortable doing, unless you're doing just like simple chords, which is not what I'm trying to do complex musical stuff, comp yeah. jumping around on the keys, doing the background music and stuff. So, um, the lyrics I have to write down because I forget them. And, and the lyrics are the trickiest part for me. And it all has to work with the music. You know, the, the, there's so much going on with just, it's not just writing words. It's the cadence of it. It's the syllables. It's fitting with the notes. It's the verses, all that. So the music, I love it. I'll just write all the music and I just remember it. Like I have a good That's memory. Amazing. Yeah. But, I was going like to say, I, I do the words. <laughs> I, I have the Scrabble dictionary memorized Okay. for eight letter words and under. I know every word that is used in the Scrabble dictionary, except for the ones that they just took out, which I had to make a video, but they took out 200 words. For the, the I have Scrabble not dictionary. watched that video. I will remedy that and watch that very <laughs> tonight or some more. So does being an anagram Scrabbler person help at all with the lyrics or those are two separate? Pieces? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It helps me with my vocabulary. I know lots of funny, True. funny, obscure words. It helps me <laughs> with just the flow of, of, of the rap of it, I mean, for lack of a better term of just how it works. And I'm solving anagrams and I'm just, 
it's combination of letters and what feels right and all that stuff. And I mean, I do that mostly just because it's just a weird nerdy hobby, hobby but I do, I, I have that skill monetized. So I, I compete. Part of the reason why I have been able to just dick around being a, a dad, reading about conspiracies and doing ragtime piano for the last 15 years is because I do make money from it. So I, I, com I compete online wow. um, with that. Um, it's not enough at, for a career, but it's enough to, to, to add extra money when I, like right now I am surviving on word game knowledge, my dictionary knowledge, um, literally. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I mean, I, part of me, is proud of that, but part of me is frustrated by that because I've spent so much time on piano. I should be able to have a career as a piano player, and I would just do this, this word stuff at the side. It it's unfortunate, but also I'm fortunate that I live in an era where the internet can make that possible because that wouldn't yes. have been possible 20 years ago um, to basically monetize memorizing the dictionary. Um, uh, so it, it, it's something, but it's not. It, it's something I have to keep up. Yeah, um, it's a, it, a, like every morning after I read the news and find out what the hot to see conspiracy of the day is I I'm practicing my anagrams 7:30 for the past wow. 15 years. I know that sounds crazy, but it, I love it. I love it. It's, it's just, it's like, I have my coffee and I do a list of anagram solving and then I move on to the next thing, but I have to keep it myself sharp. Yeah. Just like with piano, just like with any skill that you have, Exercise. you have to do it and you have to feel like you're getting into the zone. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's that zone that you're trying to tap into of, of where you are hyper-focused, but also letting go. Mm -hmm. And that's where you can get to on the piano. Like if you do it just right, I like to try to get to when I, when I play. And I think uh, you monetizing that, I think that's really cool because that's another thing I kind of advise my kids as they're becoming young men and need to have employment at some point as side hustles. I think this the olden days of having one career path forever and ever, and you get a pension diversify. and retire. Yeah. Diversify your portfolio. And How, I, yes. I remember my mom um, complaining about me 20 years ago as I, as a teenager, she said, you're spending all your time learning these words. You're never going to make money doing that. And I, at the time I was, <laughs> I was like, yeah, you're probably right, mom. But yeah. deep inside, I knew that there was, there was a reason why I was doing, like my intuition was just keep doing this. And it has been a life, it's been a lifesaver. Knock on wood. I mean, I'm so grateful that I have that um, right now. Um, but yes, do, do streaming, do some, learn a skill, learn, do something that you can, doesn't necessarily, you're not going to make a career out of it. But I tell my daughter all the time, you know, she looks like, I want to play video games. I'm like, you need to learn your, you need to learn skills. You need to learn the skill set. And, and like, we're going to work on piano. We're going to work on our crocheting. We're going to work on blah, 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 hands-on stuff. You know, That's that right. is super important right now. Many, many things. Okay, speaking of hands-on, when you're playing the Redneck Rag, is, a, <laughs> is that a Tom Breyer song? It is a Tom okay. Breyer piece. Very awesome, yeah. Your glasses keep falling down oh, yeah, and yeah, you yeah. push them up and don't <laughs> miss a beat. Yeah, yeah. So you should wear one of those things that keep I your glasses <laughs> So the, the part of the reason that that was happening was, well, my glasses were also kind of met broken at the time that was performed in in a hundred degree plus weather uh -huh. in the summer and i had sweat right all up in my face <laughs> so it was like sliding down this was like in august up in like it was like bad temper it was really hot so that's my defense but yes okay. i could and people and people in the youtube comments there of course it's youtube comments i don't really care they're they're all they're always very very mean but that's in, in a good way they're like you need to go to the gym you need to put on you need to put on contact lenses get rid of those glasses it's like all these they're trying to tell me because apparently i'm not presentable enough for the i'm not like i'm like i don't need to be whatever to write spicy songs but okay fine so watching um, that song it was amazing and i saw and maybe it's the mother in me you know and i think i'm about 15 year olds older than you and i was just like oh they slid down once then i was and i have three kids who are pre and performers then they slid down again i was like oh it was making me so nervous but you pulled it off it was amazing i'm used to it it's, <laughs> it's part it's part of the it's part of the shtick I mean, i'm a performance too i'm yeah. a performer right yeah. so it's part of the like <laughs> 
I can play and fix my glasses. I, I don't really care that much. It's, it was pretty amazing. Okay, well, we're going to have to have a whole other interview about anagrams and other things. But for now, I want to say that you heard my Ryan Dawson interview while we were just reaming on people from California. And, you know, we Southerners, we call, we have Yankees and damn Yankees, and then there are Northerners. Northerners are cool. Well, we need a name for people like you who are from California, but are not Rebels. wackadoodles. What are you? I, I just said rebel, but I mean, I don't know. There, there, there needs to be, it needs okay. to be a, a, a newer term, something new. I'll think about it. I am the word guy, right? Yes. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Okay. Come up with something because actually I was thinking after that interview and then I was like, oh, he listened to it. Cause you told me you listened to it. And I was like, I know quite a few people that are from my father confessor is from California. Um, I know like two or three priests from California. They now live not in California, but I was like, we really need a word for Californians who are normal and nice, wonderful people. So come up with that word, sir. And next time we talk, we can, um, we can push that out to the masses. <laughs> Well, this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you giving me the time to just vent off on random topics and I could do this for a while. So I appreciate you, you giving me your ear and your, and your platform too. Well, thank you so much. And I'll put all sorts of stuff in the show notes page, all the ways people can follow you. And um, I will probably have this published before your uh, album comes out, but I will insert that in after the fact. And I, I can't wait to hear it. And thank you so much for, keeping uh the normies in check and keeping those of us red pilled one day at a time yes we feel so lonely and listening to your songs makes us feel not so alone so thank you so much that means a lot to me so thank you for saying that well it is the truth thank you so much thank you bye-bye